The story begins with a certain ritual. The chief elder, surrounded by his people, makes a speech that the gods of the universe gave them the strength to fight monsters, the skill tree. He picks up a basket containing a newborn baby and shouts that Toru has a branch of skills called recovery. The baby cries continuously, switching to another time interval. We are shown the entrance to the goblin forest. A man with dark hair and armor is hunting for a certain creature. There is a tree in front of him. He has a dagger in one hand and a long sword hanging from his belt. He waves this dagger at an unknown creature and after several attempts, finally hits right into the core and tears this entity apart. He takes out a dagger and sees that the blade of the knife has deformed. The acid has corroded his knife, which he understands. He looks at the sword, and then confidently uses his recovery ability, after which the blade of the knife straightens and returns to its original shape. He fills some dishes with slime and says that this acid is already from 12 slime. Suddenly, someone calls him to wait behind. The man turns around and sees a certain animal with a mustache and sharp teeth dying right in front of his eyes. The man understands that magic has just been used. Strangers direct their blows directly at him, but he manages to jump and dodge the blow, after which the tree standing behind him breaks from the stranger's attack. The man calmly lands and looks back. One of the crowd of hunters, a blonde man, says indignantly that only he wanted to catch him, and that some old man spoiled his spell. He picks up the rest of the beast and asks how he can sell it now. One of his comrades tells him that he is almost hit. He asks about the main character, didn't he know that he always wanders at the entrance to the forest to hunt slugs? The blonde man angrily says that he collects solid garbage. The friend tells the blonde that he is telling the truth and asks him to look at his armor and weapons, because they are completely unharmed. This proves that he hunts only weak monsters. The blonde gets angry and says it's a waste of time. He suggests that the others move further into the forest and hunt for large prey. Thirty years ago, a priest and the people of his village gave him a skill that was supposed to restore something. It was enough to repair the broken knife with which he had destroyed the slime core a moment ago. However, he can only activate the skill on monster-related items, so it is useless during combat. For a long time he could not enter the forest. A man comes to the border town of Dadden to the city gate. At the brick wall there are two knights guarding the entrance. The man is met by another blonde with very long hair. He sarcastically asks him, calling him an old man, did he finish collecting dirt earlier? The knight in the background tells him to stop talking like that. The main character looks up at him and shows the badge. The blonde man says that he is aware that this is not the first time he has shown him his badge of the lowest class, an adventurer of the G rank. The main character silently turns away and leaves. The blonde man shouts after him that it's time for him to retire, because it's much easier to be a gatekeeper. The blonde exhales. In the department for the evaluation of adventurer's items, the employee asks the next client to go to her. The main character approaches her and provides acid slugs. The worker picks up objects with disgust and asks what it is. The main character does not answer anything. The woman asks if he is sure that he did not get the wrong address, because they evaluate the items obtained during the hunt. Unexpectedly, they are joined by that group of comrades with a blonde man who tells her that he was mistaken, because hunting for garbage is also hunting. They come closer and says he wasted their time while hunting, so they'll take it away. The third comrade tells the second to stand. As soon as one of them reaches out to the slugs, the main character immediately hits the man in the face, taking away his prey. The blonde also attacks him, but he easily dodges the blow so that the blonde crashes into the counter of the worker. The worker begins to panic and tremble, acid of mucus got on her. She asks what it is and asks someone to call the guards. Another polite worker approaches them, calls the first one Marika and asks if she really did it again. She turns her head and thanks the main character for everything, calling him Toru. The woman scolds Marika that although she said that the liquid from the dead mucus is safe, but she also said that you need to be careful with it. Marika calls her in A and says it's not her fault. Those comrades are taken by the guards, Toru takes his slime. Mina tells Marika to go and that she will clean up here herself. Suddenly, all the slime gathers in a heap in the atmosphere and flies back into its shell, surprising Marika with this. Ina reports that one mole horn and 15 forest slugs will cost 95 copper coins. She gives them to him, he leaves with a bag of money. Toru comes to the butcher shop, the seller greets and sees the killed animal. He says it looks like the perfect murder, however, as always. Thor does not answer anything about this. The butcher picks up the animal and says that this will greatly simplify his task of skinning it. He asks if it will be the same as always, that he will take half of the meat for himself, and the butcher buys the other half. After a while, the butcher hands him something packed, saying that it is for him. 
Then he whispers that it's a regular bonus, so let him keep it a secret from the boss. Someone from the audience shouts to the employee to stop talking and work. The butcher listens to him quite well. Toru goes with a bag of meat at night around the corner and sits down. He opens a bag with entrails, stray cats come out on the smell. The cats approach the food and begin to eat while Toru pats them on the head with a satisfied face. Then he notices something in the shadows, the eyes of an animal. He is a little sad that the third one still does not go to him. Then he gets up and says he never eats while Toru is around, so he'd better go. He collects the rest of the bag and leaves. A third animal is slowly emerging from the shadows. Toru comes to the boarding house of Everil. A woman with elf ears comes out to her. Toru holds out the package and says that it is the meat of a horned mole. This is Everil's landlord. She thanks him and says that it will surely come in handy. Her face is soft and calm, wishing well. Toru comes to his room and lies down on the bed. He closes his eyes and begins to reflect that today was no different from the others. In his opinion, nothing will change tomorrow. He opens his eyes, looks at the closet. Then he picks up his badge and checks today's skill points. He is surprised and stands up abruptly, seeing that he has enough control points. He turns his head towards the closet. He confidently and defiantly looks at the closet, approaches it and opens its doors. In the closet there is a soulless girl with long hair in a dress. This huge doll does not speak and continues to look at him. Toru looks at her with regret and remembers the events that happened 25 years ago. The followers of the Gods of Destruction at that time crawled out of the Great Abyss in the center of the world and attacked his village. They devoured the villagers, one by one. They were almost there, the hidden passage to the main road was ahead. Suddenly they were attacked by a beast, but Toru jerked and was able to kill him. While he was rejoicing at this, another monster appeared behind him. The girl excitedly shouts his name. She reaches him and takes the monster's blow on herself, protecting Tora. The boy turns to her and sees that she is trembling and standing covered in blood. The old man clicks and uses his time-stopping ability. Everything freezes. The old man turns to Thor and says that he stopped their time and that he should take her with him. Toru is trembling and holding on so as not to cry. The old man shouts to him that she is still alive. After these words, hope appears in his eyes. They go to the Temple of Healing. The healer says that this is terrible, and that even the power of the water god Aerlia cannot heal her while the stop skill is active. He adds that if you cancel it, then she will die at the same moment. Toru gets angry and refuses this idea. The old man says there may be only one way left to save her. Toru asks to tell him this way. Grandpa says that his recovery skill can save her. Toru didn't expect this, he looks at him in shock. Then he shouts to him that this is impossible, and that he can only turn back time by 10 seconds. Besides, his skill does not work on living beings. The old man says that it is so now, but if he raises his level, then everything will be different. Toru looks at his grandfather with interest, but at the same time with rejection. The old man tells him that he can discover the true power of the time god if he reaches the tenth level, because with his stopping ability, everything was the same. Toru shouts that then he can still save her. The old man agrees with this, but says that he will have to suffer a lot on the way to this. Toru shouts that it doesn't matter, because if she survives, he will do it, no matter what it costs him. In the future, the path was as terrible as the priest described it. To level up, it was necessary to kill monsters, but Toru did not know how to fight, he could only run. At one point, the gate guard couldn't look at him, he started teaching him how to wield a sword, soon he was able to hunt. He constantly saw newcomers who joined teams and were taught how to distribute skill points. He became a master of evasion and parry when he reached level 30. Once he saved a child from monsters that attacked Dadden City, because of this he lost half of the strength of his left arm. With such a wound, he still continued to hunt small monsters, every day, from morning to night. It was getting harder and harder to level up skills. But even this did not guarantee that his wish would come true. But Toru refused to give up. Returning from his memories, he stretches out his hand to the girl. Then he takes his hand away, sits on the bed and says that first he needs to raise the level. Everyone has an innate tree skill. A person can perform various miracles with the skill contained in the branches. In his head, he takes a vessel of skill points full of 10,000 units and pours it all on a tree. Restoration is the return of objects used in battle to their original state. He is at level 10. He can use his skill 10 times in one hour. It is activated through blinking at will at a distance of an outstretched river. Toru realizes that the limitation of his recovery skill has changed from an object to an object. He clenches his fist. He remembers his grandfather's words that he will be able to unleash the full potential of the Time God when he reaches 10 levels, and that it was the same with his stop. He looks at the vessel in the corridor and says that he left them halfway, but grandfather's ashes and the stop remained with him. 
He goes to the vessel, opens it and scoops out the ashes. He looks at the sand and uses the recovery skill. Nothing happens. He understands that, after all, the gods of the universe cannot return the departed souls, which is to be expected. He looks at his wounded left arm and sharply remembers everything. He doesn't understand why he saw how he wounded his hand. He wonders if recovery has the ability to look at past goals. The fruit of the tree says that the perception of the time continuum is an accurate understanding of the time continuum of goals. He looks at his hand convulsively and realizes that he feels blood flowing down his left arm. He clenches his fist and pulls me to him. He says it's clear he activated it through his gloves so he can use recovery without direct contact. He abruptly turns his head to the closet, stands up and stretches out his hand to her neck, where she had a wound. He asks himself to make it work. He uses his ability and sees a lot of memories from that event. He keeps looking at her, not seeing any reaction. He asks himself if it really didn't work. However, she makes a sound, Toru's eyes open wide. The girl comes out of the closet, looks around and asks if this is the afterlife. Toru replies that it is a closet. He asks her if he should explain everything to him. The girl with a smile asks him to tell her. He says that when he was a child, his grandfather stopped her time by stopping. He continued her treatment, and that he needed a lot of money, so it took quite a long time. The girl asks him if his grandfather really left them, Toru replies without emotion that it is. The girl thinks, Toru doubts that she recognized him. He smiles and says that if he uses recovery, he will become the boy he was then, but even if he rejuvenates his body, he will still remain an old man in his soul. The girl suddenly starts saying that there was another boy with her. Toru hides his gaze and says no, he didn't hear anything like that. The girl says it's clear to her. Toru thinks to himself that it will be better for everyone, touching his face with his index finger. The girl suddenly starts laughing and says that he has not got rid of the habit of touching his chin and calls him by name. Toru calls her Sarah and is surprised. Sarah rushes into his arms with huge screams and hugs him. He asks her when she realized it was him. Sarah says she understood from the very beginning. Toru tells her not to lie. Sarah looks at him with piteous eyes and replies that she is telling the pure truth. She says she knew about his grandfather's shutdown, so she was sure his recovery helped. She snuggles up to him, hiding her face, and says that she was surprised to learn that Grandpa had already left them. She thanks him for his help and says she is glad that he is alive. Toru pats him on the head and says that he is also glad and thanks Sarah for surviving. Sarah starts to tremble, lets out a tear and says that she should be older than him, but he has already outgrown her. Toru says that it is, and that he is no longer young. She starts crying and says she's surprised how cool he's become. Toru confusedly says that she must have imagined it. Toru pats her on the head and asks if she is hungry. She does not answer anything and begins to sniff. Toru looks at her with love and care. Morning comes in the boarding house of Uril. The sun is rising, the birds are singing. Sarah is sitting next to the sofa where Toru is sleeping soundly. She looks curiously at Thor and waits for him to wake up. Toru opens his eyes and stands up, pulling Sarah to him by the chin. Sarah automatically closes her eyes and waits with trepidation for something. But Toru interrupts and says that she seems to be fine. Sarah pulls away from him and tells him that the landlady said breakfast is ready. Toru says that's how she met her before he introduced them. Sarah doesn't answer anything and shouts to Yurul that Toru has woken up. Toru gets up and goes down to breakfast. Sarah at the table says that she is eating for the first time in the last 25 years. Toru looks at her with indignation, and Ural answers Sarah with a smile that she says amazing things. Toru apologizes to the landlady for bringing someone from his native village so suddenly. Ural replies that everything is fine, because they both sometimes have to bother each other. Besides, as a former adventurer, she is happy to support the newcomer. Toru looks at Sarah, who is eating her breakfast appetizingly. She asks Yurul if she can really become an adventurer. Toru sharply replies that she can't imagine how hard work it is. Sarah, with a wide smile and confidence, answers him that this is why she wants to help Thor. There is silence. Toru does not answer anything about it. Sarah changes the subject and asks what kind of meat it is. She admires that it is so delicious. Yurul says she's glad she liked it. Toru at this time reflects that he was trying to save Sora from the trauma of the massacre that occurred in their village. Then he thinks maybe he's just getting old, because everything is new for Sarah now. He watches as Sarah happily and enthusiastically communicates with the landlady. Toru suggests to her after breakfast to go register her as an adventurer. Sarah immediately rejoices at such an offer. Toru says they need something before that. She apologizes to Yurul and asks if she could lend her armor to her until he buys something, and that it won't be for long. Yurul says she hasn't used it for a long time. 
She asks her if she doesn't mind. Sarah happily says that she will take care of her. Errol comes with the armor and says that, as expected, the mantle has turned yellow, and the breastplate is covered with mold and rust. She repeatedly asks if she really doesn't mind. Sarah happily thanks her, and Toru reaches for her clothes and uses her recovery skill. Various memories pop up in his head along with these clothes. After that, all the armor is restored and becomes new. Eurel is surprised and asks Toru what it was. He replies that this is his recovery skill. He apologizes to her if it surprised her. Sarah puts on her armor, Toru admires her, and Eurel tells her that it suits her as if it was originally made for Sarah. As a result, Toru and Sarah leave. In a city full of people busy with their own affairs, Toru and Sarah are walking quietly. She looks at all sorts of counters and asks if it's really a festival today. Toru asks her to calm down due to the fact that many people live in this old border town. The counters are open every day. A huge depression called a black hole appeared in the center of the world. The vapors rising from there covered the earth with a veil and created monsters. This land was called desecrated because of the monsters wandering there and the inability of people to live. The city was a buffer protecting people from being captured by the abyss. Toru says that once upon a time an army of monsters was here, but it was defeated, and those who took part in this battle gained experience. Sarah asks, so why are there so few adventurers here? Toru tells her that he came here to the local adventurers. Then he stops abruptly and tells her that she can go alone from here. She turns around and anxiously asks why he is not going with her. Toru tells her not to worry, because he will be watching from a distance so that his acquaintances will not suspect anything. Sarah thinks for a second, then immediately sits down and moans in pain, saying that her stomach hurts a lot. Then she says she thinks she'll feel better if he takes her to that building. Toru looks at Sarah. Passers by turn to Sarah with surprise and misunderstanding. Toru exhales and says that only this time he will rejuvenate himself, and that about 25 years should be fine. Sarah shouts at him to wait and that he doesn't need to change his appearance. Toru says that the people around him do not think the best of him. If she is with him, then nothing good awaits her either. Sarah asks if he did something wrong. He replies that the fact is that at his age, an old man like him is still an adventurer of a lower rank. And this is not something to be proud of. Sarah indignantly shouts to him that she is proud of him. She quickly babbles that she asked the landlady how difficult it is to be an adventurer. Toru continues to look at her. She says that an ordinary person could not have lasted 25 years. In his place she would have already given up. Toru asks, really, despite the fact that he is such an old man? Sarah says he's a tough old man, so it's okay for her. Sarah takes his hand and pulls him along. At the blackboard there are the announcements that wizards are needed. A squad of 3E rank warriors. Someone urgently needs a water mage of D rank and above. They ask someone to respond within two days. Sarah asks him what it is. Toru replies that this is a bulletin board, and that here you can write a request or an invitation to the squad. Sarah says it's interesting. Then she asks Toru if he wrote anything. He replies that there was never a need for this. They are met by the same trio with a blonde man, led by those looking at Sarah with interest. Sarah and Toru approach the worker. She recognizes Tora and asks if he really came back so quickly again. He replies that he is just keeping company with a friend. Sarah enthusiastically says that she is glad to meet you, and that her name is Sarah, and she is not an adventurer yet. She asks if Mr. Toru has brought her. She first apologizes for her curiosity and asks what kind of relationship they are in. Sarah hastily tells her that they are going to get married, but he covers her mouth with his palm and says that she is from his native village, so he just cares about her. The employee looks at the document and says that she is 17. Then she holds out the ball and asks her to touch this ball. Sarah asks what it is, and she replies that it is a tool called a soul analyzer. It will allow you to test his skills. She puts her hand on the ball. Toru looks carefully and sees a branch inside the ball. Toru thinks that before they came here, he checked Sarah's skill tree with his ability to perceive the passage of time. It shows more details than the usual soul analyzer. The conversion reverses the target's attack or effect at level 1. It can be used 5 times in an hour, activation occurs through blinking. The worker says that the white tree is quite rare, and this is the first time she sees this magical skill of conversion. She says that even in their village, only she had one. If she uses it, then any attack bounces back only if it's not too fast. Toru remembers the events with a serious face, correlating them with her ability. His stream of thoughts is interrupted by Sarah, showing her badge. She happily says that her badge is exactly like his, and that he is like a couple. She rejoices that she is now an adventurer, just like Toru. Suddenly someone starts clapping them, they turn around. This trio congratulates Sarah on registration, 
calling her baby. The second one says it's about time, because they were just looking for a girl magician. One asks how about ditching this old man G rank and joining their squad and that they show her the basics. Toru tells Sarah to go home. The blonde gets angry again and shouts that the old man was not given the word. He attacks him with his fist, but Toru easily dodges again. Toru lightly touches his shoulder, after which the blonde immediately falls into a foggy consciousness. The others are shouting what he did. The Torah also concerns two other people, they also fall. Sarah looks at him enthusiastically. Toru says that he restored them to the state when they were completely drunk. They're leaving. On the way, Toru asks Sarah if she really doesn't mind all this, because in the future there will be more and more such horses. Besides, she will have to fight dangerous monsters. Sarah tells him that she has already said this morning that she wants to help Toru and she is glad that she can walk with Toru again. She hugs him and asks, on the other hand, isn't this what Toru dreamed of? She encourages him and asks him to tell his sister and she will help him. Toru tells her that he would like to go somewhere far away and that he has been going through the same entrance to the forest for 25 years. Sarah asks him if he really regrets that his life turned out that way. Toru replies that this is not the case at all. He tells her with a smile that he wants to continue being an adventurer. Sarah reaches out and invites him to be adventurers together. Thus, on that day, a lone seeker of the Torah found a detachment in the company of Sarah. They joyfully go into the forest against the background of sunset. In the goblin forest, Toru teaches a frightened Sarah how to go to the goblin forest. While Toru is calmly standing and pointing his sword down, suddenly a mole with a horn jumps out of the ground. Sarah sees all this and directs her stick at the monster. Toru hits the mole with one blow, but the animal does not die and burrows back into the ground. Sarah asks if he really ran away. Toru replies that not yet, next time. If she is ready, he asks her to try using her skill. Sarah confidently says, clutching the stick to her, that this time she will catch him. The mole abruptly comes out of the ground again and jumps towards Toru. Sarah looks at the mole and uses her inversion ability, after which the mole himself crashes into the ground, bleeding. Sarah sees and asks if it's a horn mole. Toru replies that it is, but she has slightly overdone it, because the horn has been destroyed. Sarah apologizes to Toru, who approaches the monster and says that it's okay, and that he will fix it now. He uses recovery, after which the horn returns, but he himself continues to lie dead. Sarah tells him that he revived him. He replies that this is impossible, because the soul belongs to the god of creation. He can only restore the state of the body before death. He cuts off the mole's horn with his knife, and then uses the recovery skill again, after which the horn appears on the mole's head again. Sarah understands and says that he does it cleverly. He continues to use the ability and multiply horns. Toru says that their family has increased, so he needs to add at least a little to his earnings. Sarah is happy that Toru called her family. They leave together, Sarah says that she was actually surprised that Toru was dodging so quickly. He says that he restores his body at different points in space, the more practice, the better he will be able to move. Sarah guesses and says that's why he touched himself here and there today. Toru puts his palm on her face. Sarah blushes and does not understand why he is doing this. Toru at this time looks at her tree of abilities and sees the skill of perception of space. It can analyze the target space in detail. That's what he thought. Sora's ability to catch the movements of the horned mole was too good, so this is her skill. The skill of perception of space, in contrast to his perception of the time continuum. At this time, Sarah is standing with her face ready for a kiss, but then Toru just turns away and leaves. Sarah indignantly asks if that's all. Toru turns around and asks what she's talking about. Sarah offensively passes by him further. Toru thinks to himself that when he hunted alone, he needed 20 minutes, but now the fight lasts only 3 minutes. He looks around and says out loud that it seems they will be able to go further into the forest faster than he thought. They are sitting on a hollow tree. There is food in front of them, and Sarah is happy that it is meat. She bites meat with great appetite and eagerness. In a split second, her expression changes. She shouts that it's salty so that the other animals in the forest turn around. She quickly takes a bottle of water and greedily drinks. Toru looks at her breathless face with warmth and a smile. He says that first you need to cut the dried meat into thin slices with a knife, then wrap the cheese and cracker in it, and then eat. He does it all. Sarah indignantly says that it is necessary to warn. Sarah tastes it and says it's delicious. Toru asks her if she noticed anything while they were getting here. She replies that she was surprised how easy it was for them, and that there is a well-trodden path with good visibility. She also notes that the ivy and lower branches have been cut and the stunted plants are dense, which means they have enough sunlight. Toru says that she paid attention, and that it's great. He says that the goblin forest adjacent to the city was declared a logging zone, 
and that over time they laid safe routes, pruned trees and drove away dangerous animals. He says that now there is a mountain road leading to the very middle of the forest, to three sawmills, which are famous for their high-quality wood. Sarah asks that then they are the orderlies of the forest. Toru says that he would assume that they are parasite exterminators. Toru asks her how she thinks how many experience points she scored in her water jug. She replies that she killed three monsters, which means three. Toru replies that only one point, because they killed the mole and the bird together so they were not credited for them. Sarah is indignant. He says that the experience is divided by the number of participants in the battle and rounded down, so she got experience only for a slug killed before lunch. He asks if she thinks life is not easy. At this time, Sarah thinks that Toru has been an adventurer for 25 difficult years for her sake. She abruptly hugs him and shouts that he is very cool. Toru smiles and says that's why he wants to go further into the forest today, she agrees. Toru suggests to her that as soon as their skills roll back, he wants to look for goblins, because of which this forest was so named. They are walking through a forest full of greenery and old trees. Suddenly they start to hear something. Toru warns her that goblins always hunt in groups of 2-3 individuals to surround prey, so she should not lose her vigilance. She listens. The goblin comes out of nowhere and growls at them. The next second, he attacks him with his stick. Another one comes out of the bushes from below, and another one jumps out of a tree. They are heading with aggression right at them. Toru easily dodges their blows and strikes back immediately. He kills and stabs one goblin after another. He robs one of his eyes, the other dodges his blow with a jump. But then Sarah steps in and kills this goblin. Sarah exhales and looks at the goblin corpses. She notes that they are very ugly up close. Toru hands the dagger to Sarah and says that first they need the right ear, this is proof of pacification. She takes a knife and gets down to business. The Torah dictates that then it is necessary to stick your fingers on the neck, right under the jaw, and look for a solid object. Sarah finds an object and asks what it is, is it really a goblin crystal? Toru praises her and says that she has found it, the mana stone. She doesn't understand and asks about him. Toru says that it is useless by itself, but if you put it into a special tool, then it has many uses. The mana stone trade is one of the main incomes of the border town. Toru gets up and suggests that she now stuff as many goblins as possible before sunset. Sarah asks if he won't take meat with him. Toru replies that goblin meat is not very appetizing, so no one will buy it. Sarah replies that she understands, and that it's such a nuisance. As a result, they return to the Adventurer Academy. Sarah happily walks in front, talking about the big cush over and over again. The guard at the gate, the same blonde man with long hair, tells Thor that he is early today and that if he is tired of collecting all sorts of dirt, and is thinking about retirement. Sarah interrupts him, greets him and thanks him for working so hard guarding the gate. He calls her a cutie. The guy asks Toru who this girl is. He says in a panic that it's probably just a coincidence that she's going with him. Sarah thanks him for always taking care of Toru. He remains at the gate in perplexity and wonders when old people came into fashion. The blonde is indignant and tells his friend to say something. He sees how Rickon, his friend, does not react, and asks what is the matter, and that he seems to have frozen. He awkwardly, looking away, replies that it's nothing. At this time, Toru tells Sarah that he will go to the butcher, and she should go to the appraiser. She listens. She comes and sees that there is a queue, is surprised that there is such a crowd here. She hears talk about horses hunting. The group of guys discusses everything. One says that this is what happens if you get caught indiscriminately, without thinking and that if it wasn't for him, the other would have died a long time ago. They support him. Suddenly they pay attention to Sarah and say that she is a cutie. Sarah turns to them, greets them and apologizes for having overheard their conversation. One of the guys says it's okay, because one of them is to blame for speaking so loudly. This is a hinky guy with long dark hair. Sarah says they probably got it. The nimble guy says that this is not the case, even if they look like it, in fact they are experienced adventurers. Sarah tells them that today she got out for the first time. He immediately says that if this is the case, then there is a vacant place in their team, if she wants to end up killing goblins. He wholeheartedly recommends joining them. A girl from this group is indignant and asks why he suddenly invites her to them. Suddenly, Toru comes up to them and asks Sarah if she is still in line. The guy angrily tells him why he is climbing without a cue. Sarah happily waves to him and calls him by name. They do not understand anything. Toru asks for forgiveness and says that he is with Sarah. He walks forward, and the group remains completely at a loss. At the counter, the employee apologizes to Sarah for waiting and asks how her day went. Sarah replies that it was her first day at work and she really liked it. 
she lays out a bunch of ears and horns, saying that this is the booty for today. The group stands behind them in shock, not believing their eyes. The worker looks and lists the pacification of two forest slugs, five horn moles, one sharp beaked and six fluids, as well as goblins, with a total of 21 pacifications, plus the sale of 57 mana stones. She holds out the coins and asks to count and accept them. Toru takes the bag and tells Sarah that they will go home. Sarah turns to that group and says that she appreciates them, that they invited her and asks them to somehow reveal the secret of killing goblins. At this time, the worker calls them and sees that they only have the pacification of four goblins. They all hold out one goblin ear. Toru gives Sarah one large copper coin and says it's her share. She thanks him and says that she doesn't need to, because she has so many new things. Toru says that he wouldn't have earned this money without her, besides, she's a girl, so she needs a lot of things, isn't that right? Sarah asks him if it's really money for planning a wedding. Toru flatly replies that it's not. She runs and invites him to go see the shopping malls. They walk between the counters, Sarah asks him what he would like to eat. She goes and stops by the sharp-beaked meat kebabs and asks how about it. The seller says that it is served with honey sauce, and that it is very tasty. Sarah shouts that it looks delicious, the poet she wants to try. She bought three pieces, which surprises Toru. Is she really going to eat all three pieces? She says no and holds out a kebab on a skewer, asking him to open his mouth. He listens and tries this kebab. Sarah also tries it herself and says that it's yummy and that it's tender. She's wondering what it's made of. Toru says that yes, all of the same. He offers to take another one to treat the hostess of the house. She agrees. At this moment, someone tells them that if they eat so much, they will not fit through the door. The hostess came up to them just the same. Toru says that when he met the hostess in the morning, he asked her to take Sarah somewhere. Sarah asks if that's why they came back early from hunting. As a result, they approach the public bath. Sarah says she's never been in a big tub before. Toru says that he thought that she would get tired after her first outing. He himself could not accompany her, so he asked the hostess. Sarah says she doesn't care, so maybe they'll go together. Toru is surprised that she gave out such a thing. Eurul tells her to come in faster. They go into the bathhouse and see numerous girls. Eurul accompanies and says that the bathroom is in a certain place. Sarah runs to her with a towel. They sit in the bathroom with hot water. Sarah says how nice it is here. In another room, Toru hears Eurul's voice telling Sarah that you can't swim here. Toru smiles. After a while they come out, the first Toru, followed by Ural and Sarah. Saroy thanks him for waiting. Sarah says that the bathhouse is simply amazing, and that it was her first time there. She brags and says that her hair and skin are so smooth now. Toru says that she is so beautiful that he did not immediately recognize her. Here Ural asks him to step aside for a moment to talk. Ural says that it seems that Sarah has only one set of clothes. As a result, they come to the store. A female employee is surprised that she sees Miss Ural and asks what they are picking up today. Ural tells her that she would like to buy clothes for these guys. Ural tells the guys that it's a little hot right now, so how do they like the idea of flax and cotton? Toru awkwardly replies that she knows best. The woman says she can offer them a wonderful cloth made of grain. Sarah asks if she can see what else they have in the store. The employee replies that, of course, she can. While the worker is measuring their size, Ural asks when it will be ready. She replies that she is not very busy right now, so tomorrow is for a young man and in three days for a lady. Sarah walks through the store and sits down abruptly, noticing something. Toru comes up to her and asks if something is wrong. Maybe she has a stomach ache. She holds out the fabrics and asks which one is better. Toru replies that the sky-colored fabric will suit her. She rejoices and says that she thought so. She approaches the worker and asks if she can buy this fabric for this money, showing the bag. The worker says that there are 94 copper coins here, and that she can only sell a small piece for this value. Then Toru hands Sarah more coins and asks if that's enough. Sarah asks if it is possible at all. Toru replies that if he is with her, they can earn a lot more, so don't worry. Sarah thanks him and says she loves him. As a result, Sarah leaves with a rim on which a large bow is embroidered. Ural says she is glad that Sarah is feeling better. Toru says that she has always been like this. He asks her if he is causing her too much inconvenience. Ural says that this is not so, and that she is like from the stories of Toru himself. He smiles and asks if she sees it now. She agrees and says that Sarah shines so brightly. On the way, Ural says that they will hope that everything will go without extremes. Toru also agrees with her, while Sarah herself happily walks in front with a new rim. In the goblin forest, Toru shouts to Sarah to be careful, because the goblin ran in that direction. Sarah kills the goblins one by one with her power. 
but the goblins do not end in any way, jumping out and attacking from different sides. One jumps out from behind Sarah, but he is killed by Toru, sticking his sword into his mouth. Sarah sees this and sighs with relief. Toru and Sarah were getting more and more every day, choosing the main goal of subjugating goblins. Sarah asks Thora to use her recovery skill to remove the dried blood from her. They find a plant. Sarah asks if this is the bitter herb he was talking about. Toru replies that this is really it, an ingredient for healing ointment. It cannot be grown in the city, so it can be sold profitably. Toru tells her not to uproot it, but to cut off only the top, so in three days it will grow back. Sarah is surprised and says that this means that it can be harvested many times if you remember where it grows. Toru tells her that this can only be done now, because when summer passes, the harvest season will end. They return to the gate, meet the disgruntled blonde again and pass by. The blonde's friend looks at them suspiciously. Sarah tells Thor that they have a good catch today. He agrees with this and says that the jackpot is good enough to attract unnecessary attention. An unknown man is looking at them, surrounded by guards. Sarah and Toru continue to look at the important man in armor. Toru notices a silver die on him, which says that this person is of rank B. This person asks Rickon if it is him. Rickon nods. The blonde is outraged by this, that he whispered something to an important person behind his back. This man tells Thor that a complaint has been received that he is exploiting a novice adventurer by pretending to be a guide. He asks him to follow him. Sarah wants to object something, but Toru tells her that everything is fine and that it won't be for long. They leave, the blonde man trembling with anger at Rickon. He shouts to him that he didn't think about what he would report to the security headquarters about them. He keeps talking to him in a disrespectful way. Rickon replies to this blonde, Carlos, that he was in charge when he was an adventurer. But in this job he is senior in rank, so Carlos must obey the chain of command. He asks if he really wants him to respect the one who denounced his friend, is he laughing at him? Rickon looks away and says that he clearly violated, so what's wrong with the fact that the gate guard reported where he should, and that he is hunting for dirt, so Thor should know his place? Carlos begins to boil with anger. He hits Rickon in the chest and shouts that this guy, unlike them, has worked hard all his life. Rickon looks down and sees that Carlos doesn't have a brush at all. Carlos shouts, does he really want to put a stick in his wheels because of his stupid envy? Then, in conclusion, Carlos angrily shouts to him that no matter how he looks at it, but he is the only terrible person here, Rickon. Rickon tells him that, after all, Carlos himself constantly told him that it was time for Thor to retire. Carlos keeps shouting that of course he is saying this, but Toru is as stubborn as an ass, so he will never retire. Rickon says it's strange why Carlo is suddenly so protective of him. He looks away and replies that it's none of his business. Carlos remembers how they hunted together. Toru taught him when he was a novice adventurer and didn't understand anything. He tells Rickon that he can't even believe that Rank B was involved in this case. Did they really move there at headquarters? Sarah and Toru, along with the guards, come to a special place. Sarah asks if this is really a training ground. She is not answered. She directly asks Toru what it is. He replies that it is an emulator structure that is supported by built-in mana stones. He adds that both magic and traditional martial arts skills are blocked here if her rivals are not monsters. Even with monsters, only newly acquired skills can be used. A rank B seeker picks up a sword. Toru asks him if he can listen to him first. Toru says that he and this girl are partners because they are from the same village. So he is going to train her, not use her. This man says that if he really helps him, then the two of them can go out to fight with him and prove their fitness. Toru sighs and says he doesn't want to blunt his sword, so can he also take a training one? He tells him to do what he wants. Toru approaches the swords and picks one up on the other, saying that this will not do. He starts to get angry and asks, but how many can be sorted out already? Let him figure it out quickly. Toru says there's not a decent one here. He asks to look at the sword that his opponent took. He begins to get angry and think to himself that Toru is an inept worm at all, so what is he building himself out of here? Toru takes his sword in his hands. He examines it and says that this one is still good. He's already grinding his teeth with anger. As a result, they stand in front of each other. The judges tell him to converge. The opponent immediately assumes a comfortable position to attack. One says that he immediately raised morale at the very beginning of the battle to the full. The second says that the feature of Sir Russell Battleguard was granted by the God of Fire Raffalet. Russell thinks to himself that Toru will die with one of his blows. Toru tells Sarah to watch carefully. She immediately replies with a smile that he is watching him. Russell wonders if Toru is going to fight him, rank B, one-on-one. -on -one. He shouts to Thor that he is from a low-level rank and makes a swing with his sword, 
but nothing happens. Then he realizes that he can't use his martial arts. Here Toru does not miss the opportunity and attacks him. He loses his vigilance and gets hit in the stomach with a sword. Russell lands on his knees and breathes heavily. The guards scream in shock. Toru stretches the sword to his neck and says that they will then go. He gets up and tells Sarah to go with him. Suddenly, Russell feels that his fighting rage has returned. He immediately calls a fiery blow in their direction. Toru shouts Sora's name. The barrier is triggered. The fire goes back to Russell. He groans in pain and falls on his back because he is burning in his own fire. The guards run to him and in a panic ask the others to bring water. On the way, Sarah looks back once. Later, when they were eating kebabs at the table, Sarah asked him what he had done. He raises his head. Sarah says that when Russell first picked up the sword, he looked surprised. She asks if it's because he couldn't light the sword. She adds that Toru also disliked him. She has never seen him make a fool of anyone, so she wonders if there is any special reason. Toru says that, in truth, when he handed over the wooden sword, he restored his skill tree through it. Sarah is surprised, asking if he can do that, too, it's amazing, in her opinion. When Toru saw Sarah's ability tree, it dawned on him to remake his skill tree. If you can see the past, then the skill tree can also be denied by restoration. Therefore, he tried to shorten his recovery branch a little, then the spent skill points returned to the jug. Sarah says that then he can roll back the skill tree as much as he wants, and grow other branches that he likes, is that so? Toru replies that it looks like that, and that it is usually impossible to redistribute branches. Then Toru adds that this is the catch, because there is only one branch in their skill trees. Sarah sighs with sadness. Toru says he won't use it much, because if you know what's going on, you can easily fend it off. Sarah asks if that's why he angered him so that he wouldn't notice it. Toru replies that it worked because it was a sword fight. At the first transfer of the sword, he rolled back his martial arts branch. At the end, when he touched his shoulder, he restored everything back. They're going home. On the way, Sarah asks him what he will do if they come again. He replies that the violation was far-fetched. Someone envied them because of the loot. But if they slow down, they will not be touched yet. He says that the world of adventurers revolves around abilities, so if everyone knows that a person is strong, fewer people will cross the road. Sarah says worriedly that if everyone finds out that he is so strong, women will hunt him, so she asks him to stop. Toru is thinking about his own at this time and says that he seems to guess who sent rank B for them. He says it's a problem, but he'll have to talk to them soon. Sarah worries and asks if it's a woman. He replies that it's not. Toru walks alone down the street while the rest of the townspeople enjoy their time. It passes through people who willingly play musical instruments. He's at Choi's Diner Tavern. He enters through one door. He is greeted very warmly by one man. Other important and beautifully dressed people are sitting inside. Two men, enthusiastically arguing with each other, and the woman turned her attention to him. A fairly young man is sitting next to her. This prince says that they haven't seen him for a long time, asks what wind brought him to them. The second one with a smile also says how many years, how many winters have passed since the last meeting. He sits down and says that it's really been a long time since we've seen each other. He asks one of them how she's doing, and that, as always, she looks so beautiful that he doesn't even know what to look at. The man, whose name is Stracia from Rank A, who is a member of the Platinum Flame Group, is outraged that he, as always, ignores him and always rolls up to the second one, like a real heartthrob. Toru says that they are members of the Platinum Flame and still spend time in this diner. Stracia says that he might not have emphasized it, because it's impolite, they are on good terms with him only because they studied with the same teacher. The beautiful girl's name is Ninessa, she has short hair, and she has a burn scar on her neck. She is also a member of the Platinum Flame Group. Toru orders rustic potatoes and sausages. The waiter takes the order and brings food. Toru will stay through it all and says that everything is delicious, as always. The waiter smiles at him. The old man with the beard continues to argue and shout to the other that this is why, as he said. Using this method, he will not last long. Stracia says it looks like the teacher is out of sorts. Dadden is the head of the Bureau of Adventurers of the Border City. He says that it is necessary to manage finances wisely and start multiplying with average amounts. Otherwise he will do the same as any fool from the neighboring village. Sacco, the deputy head of the Bureau of Adventurers of a border town, asks the teacher what he will do with such financing. Only they are obliged to deduct 30% for the maintenance of the army. Dadden sips from the mug and says that he knows that they don't have money. Even the repair of the outer wall won't last long. Sacco says that his hands are tied too, there is nowhere to take money, if this time the strategy works, 
then there will be prospects for highly paid orders. Toru asks the other two what strategy he is talking about. Stracia replies that he means it's time to shine a shining light on the fallen ruins. Toru asks Ninessa if she can translate this into human language. She says that the essence of the strategy is the capture of the northern district of Bosalia, which fell last year, and it is planned for tomorrow. Toru says that's why there was a crowd of A and B ranks in the bureau this morning, they must have been called up. Dadden clicks and says that he can rely on a strategy with an unknown probability of a positive outcome, and that if not tempered, iron will not become steel. Sacco says that it's not that he doesn't want to attract talented newcomers, but it's necessary that the talent and its bearer match each other and looks closely at the Torah. Dadden says that's why he got into the Torah and that he really does not disdain any methods. Then Dadden turns to Thor and asks if he really will remain silent and will not answer anything because he came here for this. Sacco tells him that he has got a girl with a rare talent. He asks if it's time for him to let her go. Toru says that's what he wanted to talk about. He asks Sacco if he could stay away from them. Sacco says that this is not even discussed. He believes that talents should work together with talents. Paired with incompetence they will not work out skills. Ninessa says that it seems that someone is plotting. Sacco's eyes widen at the sight of Ninessa. He is surprised to ask what happened to the scar on her neck. She also does not understand and examines herself. Stracia looks suspiciously at Thora. He removes the blindfold from one eye and says that he, cursed magically, will demonstrate a fraction of the power that is granted to the eye. Toru looks into Stracia's eyes and then immediately says, asking for forgiveness, that it was his doing. Stracia laughs and says that he gave up so quickly and that there is no resistance. Ninessa asks Stracia to slow down. Ninessa asks him what he meant. He says he just restored it to this level. If she doesn't like it, then he will return everything as it was. Ninessa says with a smile that no, don't. She doesn't even know how to thank him. She keeps feeling the skin of her neck where the scar was. Sacco says he understands that he can heal an old wound. He asks what else he is capable of. Toru replies that everything else is different. Sacco tells Dadden that maybe it's time for him to retire. He's not a little old anymore, isn't he afraid to overwork? Dadden shouts indignantly that he is carrying this, as long as his eyes are purple. He will not see the place of the boss. Toru orders a portion of turnips with tenderloin and a drink, the waiter listens to him. Dada tells him that he is so frivolous, they are actually discussing something important here. Suddenly, the plate is filled with food again, everyone looks at it in shock. Sacco says that he understood, it all depends on how exactly to apply the skill. He apologizes for the contemptuous attitude. Then Dadden notices something and shouts, What is going on here? He has something to do with it. Ninessa says something is going on with his head. He panics and asks what's wrong with her. He puts his palms to his bald head and suddenly notices that numerous thick hair has appeared on it. Toru says that contrary to what he said, he made him look younger. He asks what he just said, how so? Then Dadden says that, apparently, he really developed this useless skill for a long time. Sacco says that, let's say he knows how to make them close their mouths, okay. He suggests that he close it in the interrogation room at the bureau for now. He says that if someone blabbed about this skill, a crowd of priests would reach out to them and start getting them. And not only them, soon others who want to get their hair will join them. Dadden says that if this happens, he will have to hide, even lock himself in his house, and all because of his beloved disciple. Stracia says it looks like this will be retirement. Stracia asks, then why don't they have a farewell party? Thor is handed food. He says he has two conditions. The first is that they do not touch them. The second is that they remove those who decide to interfere with them. That's all he's asking for. Sako asks what they will get in return. Toku first asks him to give him time to think. Then he says that if they give him six months, he will prove to them that he can achieve the same position as the two of them. Stracia smiles, anticipating something. Sacco asks him if it is too ambitious for a lower rank. He says that if he gives him his partner, it is likely that he will be able to accelerate their progress. Toru replies that he will not be able to do this. Even with his connections and ability to push people, he cannot grow talent. He adds that he is too gifted and everything is easy for him, so he demands too much from others. He thinks to himself that in fact none of his people have risen to the rank of A in the last 10 years, except for two of the Platinum Flame. He is about Ninessa and Stracia. Dadden laughs and rejoices, saying that he will finally speak out, so he asks him to keep talking more. Sacco says that on the other hand, their director really likes to be a retired adventurer, and therefore he created a tendency for adventurers to retire early which is also wrong. 
Dadden is outraged by his words. Toru tells them that he is not here to annoy them. He just wants to continue doing what he has always done. Dadden tells him that, as always, he is not particularly mercantile. He offers him retirement and that he can stay with them. He replies that he does not want to resign, but he will think about it if he asks from the bottom of his heart. Thadden says that it is clear to him that, apparently, he still wants to be a field prickletuchensum. He asks how long he is going to do this. Toru replies that while he can, he wants to develop further. Then, to the surprise of Sako and Dadden, he says that one day he will reach the same peaks as them. Toru thinks to himself that the ceiling of the great miasma gate of the underground labyrinth lies with these two and that the best positions are occupied by the two people who save the world. Stratia embraces the Torah and says how much he likes these far-reaching plans. He does not enter into some, which he focuses on. He says he will look forward to the Torah. Thadden sees this and says that let him remain an adventurer as long as he can, and let him provide the rest. Sacco reflects, judging by the way Russell was knocked out, everything is not clean here. For the director to stay on his side is a bad political move. Sacco says he accepts these conditions. He will tell his subordinates to keep their hands to themselves, but then he should be relatively aware of his progress. Toru says he is glad that he accepted his terms. He leaves the coin and gets up from his seat. He says that since the discussion is over, he asks to be allowed to leave. Dadden gets up and asks what he's doing. It's still a child's time. He offers to sit and remember the past. Toru just leaves. The waiter with a smile asks him to come again, and Dadden remains outraged that he was not listened to. Sako asks Dadden if he's really going to let him go like that. Dadden replies that yes, because he has always been stubborn and did not listen to anyone. He asks if it is true that he does not admit defeat. Sako says that's not what he means. He asks Dadden if they will let him go home with such a head of hair at all. Toru and Sarah come with a cart to the worker. She looks and is surprised by their catch today, as many as two giant caterpillars. To tell the Torah to sell one whole, divide the second in half, sell half, and cut the second. They come out with money and meat. Sarah says she's hungry. She suggests coming home early and frying the meat. Toru tells her not to rush like that because he wants to take her somewhere today. He says that they got a lot of meat, and that they will definitely like it. They come to a dark corner. Toru puts the meat on the floor and tells Sarah to watch. Two cats run out. Sarah looks surprised. Toru apologizes to them for being late. Sarah asks if he really talked about these cats. He replies that yes, and that he often feeds them here, but has not come for a long time. Sarah starts stroking the cat and says that she also helped with the hunt. Toru tells her it's better not to touch it while he's eating. It's terribly unpleasant for him. But the cat already climbs to her with caresses. Sarah is happy and tells Thor to look at his happy little dog. He is surprised. The second cat also cuddles up to Sarah. Toru thinks he's been feeding them for six months to get them used to him. Sarah gets up and feels a strange feeling. He tells Thor that there is something interesting here and that they are probably being watched. He doesn't hear anything. Then Sarah shouts to him to see what her catch is. He turns his head and sees that Sarah has a little girl in her arms. Toru is shocked. Sarah says that here they are playing hide and seek. Is she really a local child? Toru wonders if this is the third one. The girl says that it is not necessary to eat Moo because it is tasteless. Sarah says she won't eat it and asks about the name. Moo's stomach is rumbling, and the child says that he has heard something about delicious. He sees the cats eating and breaks into them. Moo catches the Torah and picks it up. He asks if he really eats with the cats all this time. He twitches and says that this is his food. Toru asks about his parents. He is silent. Toru begins to say that you can't feed on all homeless children, and that he is very sorry. Sarah tugs at his arm with a piteous look. He exhales and says that he will have to ask permission from the hostess. Sarah tells Moo to go with her. Moo asks what they will do with him. Sarah asks if he doesn't want to have a delicious meal. Sarah gives her name and then introduces the Torah. She says that Moo can call her big sister. Moo learns their names, making a mistake in the name of Toru. Moo says he wants to eat and he asks the child not to call him that. As a result, Toru, Sarah, Moo and two other cats come home. The hostess says they have nice guests today. Toru says they seem to have become attached to him. He asks permission to stay for a while and look after them here. The hostess agrees and asks if they should heat the bath. He replies that they will be very grateful to her. Mu asks where the food is then. Toru replies that he must first wash it. Mu asks if they really decided to eat him after all. Mu ends up being a girl. Sarah asks if they can't clean up the dirt with restoration. Toru replies that he tried to scan her skill tree, but the result is zero. It looks like she hasn't earned points on monsters yet. Sarah says she will try to behave herself. 
They start watching her. Mu laughs and shouts that she is tickled. Sarah asks her not to twitch. Toru says it's strange. Despite the dirt, she doesn't have lice or anything like that. Sarah says the seals didn't have fleas either. Toru sees the scars on Mu's body. He wonders why they are. Sarah tells Mu that she has such cute purple eyes. Toru says that this is a characteristic feature of the Purple Eyes tribe. He brings the lamp to Mu and tells Sarah to watch. Toru says that they are perfectly oriented in the dark. Sarah happily says it's wonderful. Yurel hands Mu her old things and says she can take them if she wants, calling her Mumu. Sarah corrects her. Toru says that the Purple Eyes tribe often use repetitions in names, so this is also correct. He says that boys use double letters in their names, and girls repeat syllables, so her real name should be something like Lelamumu or Mumulel. He says that they have such a tradition because they consider the thunder god Jijiro to be their patron. They try to create similar names, hoping to receive his blessing. Mu changes clothes and asks Toru what Kona looks like. Toru says that she was able to dress properly, and that it suits her. They begin to eat. Sarah says that today she is so hungry in the labors of the righteous. They wish each other a pleasant appetite, and Mu eagerly asks if it is already possible to eat. They start eating. Mu bites off a piece of meat and says it's delicious. Toru tells her to chew well and that no one will take her food away from her. Sarah agrees with Mu and says that this is simply delicious. The ham is the most delicious, in her opinion. She wanted to offer to take something for hunting tomorrow, but Toru tells her to chew normally too, not to rush and wash down the food. Sarah listens and drinks the drink. Yurul thinks to himself if only Toru could have met these children earlier. She notices something and asks Sarah if something is wrong. Sarah apologizes and says that she only noticed now, but her ears are longer than usual. Yurul says she's from the Ashir tribe. Sarah says she thought so, that she was from afar. Toru says that the hostess's homeland is in the north. He has heard that their ears have lengthened to hear better on the snow-covered plains. Yurul says that this is not the case, and that this is in order to better hear the teachings of the ice god Strachan. Toru apologizes. Yurul adds that this is what they are told. After all, they are often teased by grey rabbits. Yurul asks, Sarah doesn't know much about other countries. Sarah apologizes and says that they grew up in a remote village. Yurul tells her that if she wants, she can teach her a little bit. Sarah readily agrees and says she would be very grateful. Yurul begins to tell that hundreds of years ago a huge hole opened in the earth, and overnight the country disappeared into it. Various monsters appeared from the Great Abyss and the world turned into a continuous chaos. A long time ago there was a big country in the center of this continent. This country was technologically advanced, and its inhabitants led a peaceful and prosperous life. The refugees scattered everywhere, settling in remote regions. Eventually, people blessed with the powers of the six great deities began to appear, and the population of the central region, where people like Thor and Sarah live. The central region is under the protection of all six divine forces. Sarah says she was surprised when she saw people with horns or scales. She now understands where they come from. Toru says that, basically, it's because they rarely visit their village. Yurul asks Toru what his plans are for the future. Toru replies that at first he wanted to feed Mu and send her away, but he thinks he will look after her a little more. He remembers that his teacher also had purple eyes. Toru goes to the Bronic Ram, who joyfully greets him, saying that he has not visited them for a long time. Is he really looking for something? Toru says he has come to place an order. He asks if they are busy right now. Mu and Sarah came with him. Ramu says that usually people do not carefully monitor the equipment, and then bring it in a battered condition for restoration. He punches Thor lightly in the chest with his fist and says that he takes excellent care of his things. Everything is like a needle. He wants to clarify whether he really came to place an order. Toru says that he urgently needs a new pair of shoes. Ramu asks if this is really an order for this child. Toru calls them and asks them to say hello at least, and that the owner of the store may look a little intimidating, but he knows his business. Sarah greets him and says that she is his future wife. Ramu wonders when he managed to get married, and even have a child. Toru says that he is just looking after the daughter of an acquaintance, and he picked up the child only yesterday. Ramu thinks about it and calls Mu a boy, saying that he will now take the measure of his leg, so let him come to him. Sarah says it's a girl. They're taking measurements. Ramu says he will make it so that there is a little bit of growth, whether the shoes will fit them. Mu asks Toru why. He replies that this is so that her feet don't get dirty. Toru asks if he can make their soles soft, like the pads of a cat's paws. Ramu says that this is his request, he will try to use a soft material. Toru reminds that it seems that Ramu was grumbling about the raincoat, the order for which was cancelled. If he is not mistaken, then it is made of hippopotamus skin. 
Ramu says that he is talking about a cloak that he never sold. Ramu sharply asks him if he is going to drag this child with him on outings, he does not answer anything. Ramu makes a hand gesture saying he wants to talk outside. Mu repeats after him and asks what he is showing, is it really such a greeting? Sarah says that this gesture means a desire to talk outside. Those two come out, Ramu starts shouting what he's up to, orders equipment for a child who looks like he won't last long in combat conditions. He knows that Ramu doesn't like bad work. Toru says she may be small, but she has talent. Ramu begins to object, saying that he knows that Toru will not lie for a red word, however. His speech interrupts Tora and says that he will show him a trick now, but he asks not to tell anyone about it. He takes the leather armor in his hands, worries about the frame and says that it requires serious repair, so you shouldn't just touch it. He uses his skill and hands ram a new and clean armor. He does not believe his eyes and says that there is not a single scratch. Ramu enthusiastically spreads his arms. Mu asks, and this is also a sign of greeting. Sarah replies that this means that he conceded in the dispute. Ramu tells him that he doesn't understand anything. It's clear as day that it's not a trick, but the armor was in terrible condition. He asks what he has done. Toru replies that this is his skill, and that he has trained him and can now pull this off. Ramu asks if it is true, he rejoices and shouts that it finally happened, that he was finally able to do it. He quickly slaps Thor on the back. Then he calms down abruptly and says that he probably rejoices in vain and that with such a situation he can lose a good half of his earnings. Toru assures him that he is not going to compete with him, and that he will stay to do adventures with them. He adds that this skill can also be applied to people, so that they don't have to worry, Mu won't die so easily. As a result, he asks what he thinks and if he will take the job. Ramu is already confident and quite says that then he will try to do something especially for her. Toru also picks up another armor, swings his arm and completely restores it. Ramu, surprised, picks up the armor and says that the damage on the hippopotamus skin armor has also disappeared. He asks to wait and asks what happened to the patch then. He understands that it is possible to seal the diverging seams, but how did he cope with the torn pieces? Toru says that such is his recovery skill that he can recover some of the lost material. He asks in surprise, is it really so? Toru starts talking about if he could get dragon skin armor. After these words, Ramu's face just starts to shine. Then he seriously says that no, it's not such a shortage, but the skin of the white ferret. What does he think about it? Because it is also very valuable. Unexpectedly, Toru says that he actually has limitations in his recovery skill. He studied its capabilities by cutting the horn of a horn mole. Its limit is the recovery of 30% of the missing. Sometimes even a small piece is difficult to recreate. He believes that this is because the brain does not represent the finished form of the object and perceives its current state as completed. Ramu then asks if this means that the bigger the armor he gets, the greater the benefit. They shake hands in a brotherly way. Mu and Sarah have been watching them through the window all this time. There is that group of four people standing in the Adventurer's Bureau. The long-haired man asks Rickle if he has heard that the old man they encountered is actually something with something. Rickle asks if this is really true. The third one adds that he also heard something like that. There is a rumor that he even won a B rank. The girl does not believe and says that something looks like a bike. The third guy says that he heard that the girl who is with him used some cool skill that no one knew about. Rickle immediately remembers and asks if it's really that cutie. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted by a loud shout from Moo who asks Toru what kind of place this is. Everyone turns to them together. They see that Toru is now coming in with the child. The girl asks where this child came from. The third guy with a red face says that Sarah and Toru are actually a guy and a girl. One says they don't look like relatives at all, no matter how you look at it. Rickle says she just called him dad. They do not understand and continue to follow them, wondering what is going on at all, maybe it's a stepdaughter. Toru asks Mu to keep his voice down, and that this place is called the Bureau of Adventurers. Mu repeats the name and says that the hostess told her something like that. She asks if this is really his job. Sarah bends down and says that as her teacher, she will show her everything here. Mu points to the bulletin board and asks what it is. Sarah says that this is a bulletin board, and that they write here that someone wants or offers to do something together. Mu immediately asks if she can write something on it. Sarah immediately agrees. Toru did not even have time to be indignant. Mu stands on tiptoes, but still does not reach. Toru lifts the child in his arms and asks if it is convenient. Mu happily draws five people on the board. They ask her what it is. She points to the biggest one and says it's Toru, and Mu is holding his hand next to him. 
Sarah points to the little ones and asks what it is then. Mu says that it is Kuro, a black cat, and Shima, a striped cat. Sarah points to a separate person and asks if it's her. She replies that no, it's the hostess. Toru asks if she's finished, then they'll go to the bureau counter. Sarah anxiously asks why she is not here. Mu passes the registration of adventurers. The employee asks if she can handle it for sure, because according to the document, she is only nine years old. Toru says that after all, the minimum age of an adventurer, according to the requirements, is eight years. He also adds that this girl is a magician, and that she will not need to approach monsters. The employee says that, unfortunately, she cannot allow this. Toru asks if he can hear the rationale. Ta explains that in the lightning magic of the Violet Eyes tribe, there is no lower branch responsible for the basic attacking skill, so by default, the initial skill of Mu is a rare electrical detection. Using the owner of such a skill to detect monsters will not allow her to advance in development, so she cannot give permission for this. Toru asks again, is it really because she will not be able to earn skill points? The employee confirms this. Toru says not to worry about it, because they will understand everything by scanning her skill tree. The employee looks at him with annoyance. She puts a ball in front of her and asks her to put her hand on this analyzer. She reaches out and puts her hand. Mumimim with a purple lightning ancestral tree bestowed by the lightning deity. Her available skills are an electric spine. Toru says that the electric spine is a passive magic skill that allows her to counterattack the attacker. It will allow her to score points. The employee awkwardly says that there shouldn't be any problems then. So now she will give her an adventurer token. Mu holds out her hand to him. Toru squeezes her palm in the same brotherly way as he did during the conversation with Ramu. She is given a token. Toru says that now everything is ready for a sortie. Then he stops abruptly and asks where Sarah is. They see that Sarah continues to draw on the blackboard and says that she is still drawing. She leans on a high chair. They approach her. Toru goes on. Sarah says that everything is ready and that it's better that way. Mu looks back at the board for a second and moves on. Toru shouts to Sarah that they are already leaving. Sarah begins to resent, since when did it start like this? Sarah herself is now drawn on the board, holding Mu's hand with a wide smile. Sarah runs to Thor and Mu. Mu clenches his fists tightly and shouts that everything is fine. Toru watches her and sees a huge amount of electricity forming around Mu. Sarah is surprised and asks what it was. She notes that it is so beautiful. Toru answers her that this is magic called Electric Spike. It counterattacks the enemy when attacking the user. Mu says the itch is gone now. Sarah then tells her that she doesn't seem to have any more fleas. Toru puts his palm on Mu's head and checks her skill tree. Electric Spike. When attacking the user, it automatically counterattacks the enemy. When using the recovery on the branch of the Electric Spike, the kidney will return to zero level. Mu has had this skill since birth, and there are only three buds on the tree, as Toru himself notes with a smile. Toru says that this is great and now she is invited to try it in his eyes. She looks up, and Sarah carefully follows the movements. She suggests why Mu should look into his eyes. Suddenly, Sarah has a strange feeling. She turns around and wonders where the same feeling comes from, as in that alley. Mu immediately looks down. Toru asks her if something is wrong, because a moment ago she was so cheerful. Mu excitedly asks in response if Toru will be angry with her. Sarah is worried and doesn't understand what's going on. Toru tells her that everything will be fine and that he won't get mad at her. He's rather happy that you want to do it. Mu asks again if this is exactly true. Toru sits down, strokes her cheek and says she doesn't need to worry so she can look at him again. She looks with a smile and in the next second finds herself at her own tree. She says what a strange tree grows here. Toru says that he is glad that everything went well. He asks her what she sees among the roots. Mu asks if he means this round thing. Toru tells her that this is her special ability to exchange feelings. The exchange of feelings allows you to exchange feelings and emotions with a goal that is active all the time. This ability has great efficiency and operates in the field of visibility. Toru suggests that she, most likely, because of the fear of using this skill, began to live with cats. It is difficult to find someone born with a spiritual instrument. It must be that others saw her as a child of evil. They return to the forest. Toru asks her if she is coping. She doesn't answer anything and immediately hugs Toru, with a sleepy Sarah sitting in the background. Toru suggests trying again. He asks if she sees these three buds on the trunk, she replies that she does. Toru explains that in order to raise the level of the average kidney, she must pour this vessel of water on the roots. Mu obeys, picks up a large vessel with water and pours everything to the roots of the tree. Immediately after that, a branch begins to grow on the tree. Mu screams that something strange has grown. 
an arrow-shaped branch with a curved base. The electric radar shows the direction and distance to the enemies located in the vicinity. Toru asks her if she will try to use it. She happily replies that, of course, she will try. Against the background, Sarah is watching all this with interest. Mu clenches his fists, closes his eyes, and then, when he opens, numerous electric arrows fly in different directions, enveloping trees and flying past people. Mu shouts, pointing her finger somewhere that she felt something in that direction. Toru listens to her and offers to take a look. Sarah doesn't understand and asks, asking to wait, what is going on and why she can now use two skills. Toru turns and points his index finger at his mouth, asking him to be quiet. Sarah asks in a whisper, does Mu have three kidneys of skills? Mu runs to the place and says that here it is. It's a slug crawling on a tree. Toru picks up Mu in his arms, giving him a knife. Toru tells her to aim at this whirling round core, she must destroy it. Mu hits him and kills him. Toru praises her, saying it's a good job. Mu asks if she did a good job. Toru replies that yes, it's just wonderful. Privately, he came to the conclusion that it was more convenient than he thought, especially for a limited skill. Sarah comes and pats Mu on the head, saying that she has dealt with him, but her little sister is not going to lose to her. Toru tells Mu that she is doing great, but the next step will be very difficult. Mu confidently says that there are no problems, and that she will definitely cope with it. Toru says that then it's fine, after which he suggests that she go back to the tree and look. Toru tells Mu to try to grow an upper kidney this time. Mu happily listens and pours a vessel of water to the roots. The kidney grows. It is a lightning needle that increases the speed and dexterity of the user. Toru asks her again if she wants to try. Mu is already preparing for this and is calling for a thunderstorm. Little lightning bolts came out of her body and stayed there. Sarah says it looks so painful, is it exactly safe? Toru asks her how she is, if she feels pain. Mu replies that everything is fine, there is no pain, only some strange feeling she is experiencing. Toru holds small stones in her hands and tells her then to try to dodge them. He throws them lightly one by one. Mu easily dodges without much effort. Even the last stone she missed, leaning back with her body. Sarah says admiringly that it's incredible, and that she's dodged them all. Mu raises her hands and joyfully shouts that she was able to awaken a new power. Toru says it's a great job and that he was able to do even better than he expected. Mu hugs him. Toru asks her if she can now share this power with him. She immediately says that, of course, but how can she do it? Toru says that she probably never did a reverse exchange of feelings. She doesn't understand what the reverse means. Toru remembers Sarah's words that those cats didn't have fleas at all. He tells her that this is true, if you do not take into account the scabies of Mu, then why those cats were not in such a state. Mu shouts that Kuro and Shiro are always with her. Toru says with a smile if she doesn't mind sharing with Toru. She begins to think and act. Lightning also appeared on Toru's body. He asks if she could close her eyes and also cover her ears and plug her nose. He says to share with him only the thunder needle. Mu says that everything will not work out at once. She obeys him, closes her eyes and ears. Toru feels something and says that right to the point, it turned out. He checks and at high speed gets behind Mu and picks her up. Toru says it's great and that they will start hunting. Sarah asks them to wait a minute and asks what about her, isn't she with them? Mu tells her that it's too early for Sarah. Sarah says not at all, she asks Mu to share it with her too. She is ignored, Mu tells Thor that she is hungry. Toru gives her an apple and tells her to eat it then. Sarah stays behind with a sad face. In the evening, they come to the branch of the Adventurers Guild and put numerous goblin ears on the table. The worker is surprised and says that, as far as she sees, Tora brings more and more every day. The use of an electric radar and a lightning needle increase the number of enemies encountered, allowing you to speed up the hunt. She hands them the money and says that there is one silver coin, one half silver coin and 37 copper coins. They take the money and leave. The worker reflects that recently most of the goblin hunting squads have not had particularly outstanding results. But at the same time, for some reason, the Toru squad has become better at destroying them. She wonders how a squad of 50 people can find 50 monsters in a day, let alone kill them. They go home. Mu sleeps on Toru's back. Toru says that the whole day of wandering through the forest and hunting must be very tiring for her. Sarah says with a smile that Mu was incredible, and that she used those skills and switched between them despite having just learned them. After using the inversion skill three times, Sarah runs out of mana and it becomes difficult to breathe. Toru says there's nothing you can do about it, because they have different mana reserves, and inclination matters. Besides, it depends on the type of magic used, like Mu's electric spikes that got rid of her fleas. Most likely, she increased her strength by constantly applying them to herself. 
He says that inversion cannot be used until she is attacked by a monster. But when it happens, Sarah is capable of a lot. Sarah tells him that she can also carry Mu. Besides, Toru must be tired. He thanks her and says that everything is fine, and that when he gets tired, Toru will let her know. Sarah tells him that he can rely on her. After all, she wants to get along better with Mu. Toru agrees and says that it's strange that she dislikes only her. He suggests that perhaps in the past she used to exchange feelings for girls of the same age as her and something bad happened between them. Toru says that's why she shouldn't rush, she just needs to relax. Sarah says he's right. She thanks him for worrying about her. Toru says she has a request. Sarah happily asks what it is. He asks if she slept with the cats last night. Sarah says that it is and that this couple came to her by themselves and she was very hot to sleep. Toru asks how about exchanging Mu for two cats. Sarah says that the cats initially followed Mu to Toru's room, but in the middle of the night they started scratching her door. Sarah says she's not sure exactly, but in her opinion, it was. Sarah then offers to sleep with Mu and the cats together in her room, and since there will be no room in her room, Sarah will be able to sleep with Toru. Toru refuses and says that his bed is too small and it will be hard to sleep. Sarah shouts at him that he is a liar because she knows that Toru can sleep anywhere. They are approaching Ural's house, in the border town of Dadan. At the main gate, numerous people are escorting troops on their way. At Choi's institution, Toru heard that all the high ranks had been sent to Bosnia for an operation to bring her back. In the goblin forest, the three of them continue hunting. Every movement of the Torah is supported and protected by the magic of Mu. They kill several caterpillars. Mu asks him in the end if he has dealt with all of them. He replies that he has dealt with them, and that they are finished. He adds that hunting large caterpillars is a battle with scabies, so the electric shield turned out to be very useful. Sarah tells Mu that they need to get rid of this fur, and asks her to help build a fire. She replies that she is busy right now. As a result, she comes up and stretches out her hands to the fur. Sarah does not have time to tell her not to touch this white fur, because she will itch. Mu immediately shivers and shouts that she is itching all over now. He takes Thora's hand and says with a pitiful look that she is itching all over. He uses recovery and relieves her of scabies. Mu says it's much better now, and Toru tells her that Mu should listen to Sarah. Sarah says that Toru now looks like a real father and asks if it's time to have a nice wife. Toru ignores these words of hers and tells Mu that it's great and offers to deal with this white fur. They make a fire, telling Mu to be careful not to get burned. The Torah shows that if you put a branch into the fire, the fire will spread to it. She takes a stick and is surprised. They load the tracks into the cart. Sarah asks if this means that the cart won't pull three at a time. Toru says that it's a rolling thing, and the rank of the magic stone is too low, but pulling on it is much easier than carrying it on your hands. Toru notices Toru's sad face and asks what it is, did the caterpillars interest her? He assumes that she is thinking about caterpillar meat and whether it is tasty, she confirms this. Toru suggests getting home first, and if she gets tired, Toru will carry her. Mu is happy about this. They come to the gate. Carlos is standing there and asks him where he found this baby. He was not on guard only yesterday. Sarah greets him and thanks him again for his hard work. Carlos says that Sarah is as sweet as ever and asks if she wants to have dinner with him. Sarah says what a great idea it is, they would all love to go. Carlos says that there is no need for excessive familiarity. Mu wakes up and asks if they have already come home. The first thing she sees are Carlos' eyes. Carlos asks what it is, is she not from here? Carlos pushes her in the forehead. She starts to get angry and shout what kind of stupid guy is this, and what he's doing with Mu. Carlos says that for her he is Mr. Carlos, and she does not understand how he knows the name Mu, and that he is very suspicious. Toru just agrees with her. They pass on. Toru shouts to him that they will see each other again. Carlos shouts after him that they haven't finished yet. As a result, the Bureau gives them two silver and 18 copper coins. A week has passed since joining the group with Sarah. During this time, they were able to accumulate five silver coins, the same amount he was able to accumulate in his bank account. It's a similar story with skill points. He and Sarah have about 150 points, Mu has about 70. If they continue at the same pace, these two will be able to improve their skills to the second level within two months. They walk past the counters. Mu shouts that there is so much food here. Toru explains to her that it is for sale, and that she will not be able to try it without having money with her. Mu, hearing about the need for money, says what kind of savages they are. Toru is surprised to ask where she learned this word. Sarah comes with a barbecue and gives it to her. She opens her mouth and takes a bite with great appetite. Sarah holds out one skewer in the Torah. 
He asks where she bought them. He is surprised that she is actually familiar with this place. Mu is happy and says it's so delicious. Sarah tells her that there are lots of goodies here. There is silence. Toru looks at them. Toru suddenly says that there is a swimming pool nearby. He offers to go there together later. Sarah, in a panic, says that she is not ready at all. Toru does not understand her and says that they are just going to wash. Sarah replies that the girls, does he know, have enough worries. Toru, after a silence, replies that since she says so, then they should go back. He offers to take the hostess with him after the horses have a snack. As a result, they come to the building. Mu is surprised to learn that this is the bathhouse. The girls leave separately. Toru says they will see each other later. Mu starts to resist. Sarah says that the girls should go the other way. She shouts that she wants to go with Toru. As a result, they change clothes. Yurul tells them to wrap a towel around themselves. While Sarah was giving Mu a towel, she immediately disappeared. Mu is standing by the pool and says that it's not so bad here. She asks if she really needs to get in there. He tries to stick one leg in and immediately winces at the fact that it's too hot. She activates the ability in anger and jumps into the water, shouting that she is not going to lose. Sarah grabs her from behind and says they need to wash first. They sit on stools and begin to wash. Sarah and Moo cheerfully help each other by rubbing their backs and pouring out water. Sarah tells Moo that they are back in the foam. Moo says that swimming is so much fun. They laugh, and Sarah agrees with her. Yurul helps them. As a result, they are sitting in the pool. Sarah reflects that a week has passed since her return to this world, but it seems as if there is a big gaping hole left. Daily trips to the forest tire her out a lot. Of course, they disperse her daily routine, but she has nothing more to ask from the only remaining person who is most important to her. Sarah watches Moo swim and asks her if she loves her sister. She replies that she does not know. Sarah says that she understands and that Sarah loves her very much. Moo says she doesn't hate her sister. Moo sees a fan and asks what it is. Sarah says that this thing is called a fan and that for five copper coins you can install a magic stone in it and it will blow for five minutes. They indulge next to the fan. Ural hands them apple juice and drinks with them. They come out of the bathhouse. Ural apologizes to Toru that they made him wait. He replies that he, too, has just left. He asks if Mu has behaved well. Mu begins to tell that the opponent was quite strong, but she is not going to lose next time. Sarah says it's like she's been reborn, so tomorrow she'll try her best. Toru tells her that this is not the case because they have a day off tomorrow. Had he forgotten to tell her that? In Ural's house, a man later approaches Thor. He bows and asks, asking for forgiveness, if he could help him. This is his teacher Dadden. Toru asks if he really wants him to rebuild the stone wall in the end. Dadden says that when he asked the temple of the earth god Gaidaros for this, they asked him for 10 gold coins. Dadden asks if he could do him a favor, in addition he will give him all the devices on the magic stones that he used. Toru asks why such an unexpected request. Dadden says that nine years have passed since the monsters attacked this city. Everyone is gradually beginning to forget about it, and that they do not feel danger. Toru remembers what happened nine years ago and agrees with him. He says it will be bad if he fixes it completely at once, so it would be better to start with first aid. Dadden rejoices and says that he relies on him. He says that now the main forces have gone on an expedition to Bosalia and several reports have arrived. Toru asks if the number of goblins has increased. Dadden is surprised and asks if he really knows about it. Despite the excellent work of the electric radar, the number of goblins in recent days has been very strange. Dadden says that he knows that it is bad to help only when troubles have already occurred. However, for the sake of protecting the residents of this city, it is not scary to disgrace yourself. Toru says that he mentioned it, so don't let him worry. Moreover, does Dadden mind if he goes now? Dadden says that he doesn't mind and that he can go. Dadden says that he stayed at Sacco's that day because of the pangs of conscience. He was tormented by nightmares when his hair grew on his head. Dadden spent the whole day there before returning, but now everything is fine, which is why he will leave the restoration to the Torah. Sarah went shopping with the hostess, so Toru was forced to go to restore the wall with Mu. They come to the wall. Toru says that things are worse than he thought. He tells Mu that he will go and find out something now, so he asks her not to go far away. Mu obeys him, sits on a board that flies, and says that now Mu will be like the wind. Toru thinks that without a teacher, even a child made of special silver cannot acquire the necessary form. Toru looks at the wall and wonders where he should start. The outer wall has the shape of a horse's hoof, pointing to the east, surrounding the city. One of the entrances is located on the lower city, going beyond the gate, there will be a forest of goblins on the right. 
On the other hand, the main gate is located. They overlook the road that runs in front of the city. There are two districts inside, internal and external. They are separated by a moat, over which bridges are laid. If the outer walls are attacked, the bridges will be destroyed. Toru goes with a wooden ladder and says that it is fine, and that he will start with the most affected parts. Such damage has been inflicted only on cities that have been attacked by monsters several times in the past. Hiding while using recovery will not work but covering a large area at once will not work. He stretches out his hand to a huge crack and says that first he will return this hole to the state of 10 years ago. He's doing great. It is very easy to detect the difference. He doesn't think anyone will go that far, but it would be bad if someone discovered it. Perhaps he should reduce the area only to the damaged area. He smiles and thinks that it is impossible to completely restore the large missing fragments. But a piece of the wall looks solid now, and the cracks have closed, so it's already good. Toru says that at this rate he will have to use the skill many times. He would like to have a choice of several goals now. But the choice of multiple goals can only be used in special circumstances. The effect weakens due to the dispersion of forces on several targets, but if you get used to it, it allows you to attack several monsters at the same time. Toru says it's pointless to want what he can't get, but maybe it's worth trying it now. He used restorations in many situations. If you remember yesterday's hunt for large caterpillars, then the scabies passed so quickly. Toru realized that if he looked into his mind using keywords, he could find a lot. He's talking out loud about something flawless. He finds a wall in the conscious state and restores it. He fixed about 50 steps. Mu happily runs to him with cats and asks if he is done with work. Toru says he needs to wait for the number of recovery applications to be updated, so she can go and play some more. That fun is played on. Toru pulls out his sword and says that since he has to wait, it might be worth trying out this iron sword. He makes sharp swings. He feels this fear and comes to the conclusion that it is nothing compared to a wooden sword. If he can't handle it, he won't be able to move on. He made more swings and finished training. After a while, he says that by some miracle he was able to cope with the restoration of the northern wall in a day, the next one will be the southern one. But first he needs to rest. He comes to Mu and says they are coming back. They come home, where the hostess and Sarah have cooked dinner. They sit down at the table, cats eat under the table. They cheerfully discuss something among themselves and begin to eat. After a while they find themselves in the forest. Toru tells them that today they are going to hunt an armored boar. Sarah says it's wonderful and that it sounds like a great party. Mu confidently shouts that Toru can leave everything to her. Toru says that armored boars are huge beasts, whose height can reach a human shoulder. He is not such a simple opponent. His skill is first, level smoke screens, and his magic and martial arts don't do much damage. Usually, he needs second or third level skills to win. But you can defeat him and watch him carefully before that. Victory over him means before the rank of F Mu says she understood him, and that's how Toru's record turned blue. Mu says she wants blue too. Toru laughs and says that yes, of course, everyone wants to. Mu immediately gets down to business. In search of the armored boar, she used an electric radar for the next two hours. Suddenly Mu asks what is the boar's lair. Toru immediately covers her mouth with his hand. Sarah says that's not the case, and that it's probably a goblin lair. They see that they are starting to come out of there. Toru sees a hobgoblin among ordinary goblins. Sarah doesn't understand him. Toru explains that this is a subspecies of goblins, and that they are rarely seen on the surface. He assumes that if everything goes like this, there will surely be a procession. The goblins keep coming out. As time goes on, there are more and more of them. This must be the dungeon. Mu asks what a dungeon is. Toru explains that this is a deep hole in the ground where strong monsters live. We can say that it somewhat resembles the Great Abyss. This is a kind of outpost for the expansion of possessions. In its depths there is a so-called black hole. This black hole exists in every dungeon, and, according to one theory, is connected with the Great Abyss. Its master protects the labyrinth, and thick clouds of miasma flow out of the black hole. If you leave everything as it is, the number of monsters will only increase. Mu asks the Torah, this is called an invasion. Toru says that this is the case, and that the invasion may occur for another reason. If the monsters on the surface are not destroyed, then it can happen due to the reduction of the territory available for life. In the worst case, if all the monsters from the dungeon get out and take away the territory from those living on the surface, the result may be a double invasion. Mu asks if he will fight them. Toru says no, and that it is impossible, because there are not enough of them for such a horde of goblins. He adds that all they are capable of now is to report it to the nearest sawmill. There are three sawmills in the forest, but they have time to warn them all. 
Toru says that it is good, suggesting that they return as soon as possible. Sarah agrees and suggests to hurry up. Mu doesn't mind either. Toru burns an unknown triangle. Mu asks him what it is. He replies that this is a reward for restoring the wall, an incendiary mixture, and an igniting cylinder. Monsters hate the smell of incendiary mixture. He says it should work well on hobgoblins too. He throws a stone right into their lair. The goblins start to panic and look around. Toru shouts to the girls to run in one direction now. At this time, the group of four is also hunting. Isoku repeats to Rikaru once again that they are not ready for this yet. Rikaru objects that attacking is much faster. Hisoku says that last time they were able to somehow cope, but the next skirmish may not be so successful. Rikaru tells him that he is too afraid, because without trying, nothing will be found out. The girl starts swearing, how much longer are they going to continue this? She doesn't like that it's always like this. The girl turns to the third guy Sisson and says that he is their leader, let him say something. Sisson says there's nothing to be done, so let her leave them, because that's the way guys are. Despite all these harsh words, initially this squad was not like that. But Sisson understands their discontent and irritation. A few days ago, a newbie girl appeared who was able to achieve outstanding results on her first day. Since that time, the atmosphere in their squad has changed slightly. They're talking about Sarah. Rikaru and Hisoku have been friends since childhood. They all left the village together. In the border town, they happened to meet the magician Elysia, and half a year has passed since the creation of the squad. A rich, high-ranking life lies ahead. You just have to grit your teeth and try your best. However, they initially did not have any outstanding talents. Suddenly, the earth begins to shake. They see in front of them, just the same armored boar. They panic. The monster takes aim and growls at them. Hisoku asks if it's really an armored boar. He says he is much bigger than usual and has more legs. Rikaru steps forward. Sisson shouts at him to stand, warning him that he cannot defeat him. Rikaru only shouts to him that he will deal with him. The monster is coming at him. He jumps and makes a swing with his sword, but he realizes that it even scratched him. The monster with its muzzle throws Rikara back, that he crashes into a tree. Blood is coming out of his mouth. The other three are screaming his name in panic. Rikaru turns to them in convulsions and tells them to run in a plaintive, trembling voice. The monster is advancing on the others with a quick stomp. Sisson pulls out his shield and tells the others to run. Isoku begins to tremble, he freezes in place. Sisson runs off to the side, leading the animal. Elysia runs to Rikar. Sisson thinks that if he can withstand a couple of his attacks, he can buy them some time. Alicia conjures and tries to cure Rikara, asking him to talk to her. However, Rikaru looks soullessly into the void and does not answer anything. Odessia shouts that healing water of the first level cannot heal him. Then she hears another sound, turns around. He sees that the monster's fang has gone through his shield and pierced Sisson's chest. The monster jerks its head, trying to remove it. Sisson holds onto the fang and barely speaks, asking for help. As a result, he leans back, removing himself from the fang hits a tree and falls face down. Elysia begins to sob and tremble, not believing her eyes. She sees that the monster is looking right at her. Suddenly Rikaru gets up and tells her to run. She hugs Rikaru and shouts that she won't leave him. The monster is rushing towards them, but suddenly an arrow hits him right on the forehead. It was Hisoku who shot an arrow at the monster with trembling hands. The monster abruptly turns to him. Alicia shouts at him to run. He fired an arrow at the moment when Elysia covered Rikara, but his legs do not move. He, as always, cannot move. The monster knocks Hisoka to death, breaking his bow and arrows. Sisson shouts his name in sobs. Hisoku is lying on the ground with broken limbs. Sisson looks back at her companions and thinks that they were arguing just a couple of minutes ago. She does not understand why this is happening. She had used all her magic, and this would be the last time. She heals Rikara. She utters the words to give a drop of water to her children who strive for the Lord of the Tree of Life. The monster turns to them. Alicia gets up with the thought that at least she was able to save Rikara. She walks towards the monster in fear. At this time, Rikaru sees a silhouette in front of him and thinks that this is the god of death. Alicia clutches her weapon tightly, then feels that someone has put a hand on her shoulder. It's Toru telling her that she did a great job and that everything will be fine now. She begins to sob. Then Rikaru gets up and asks what happened to him. Elysia looks around. Here Toru shouts to Sarah that he is leaving them to her, and Mu asks to lend him some strength. Sarah obeys him, and Mu activates the thunderstorm. Toru moves quickly and comes to Hisoku. Elysia sees that he is alive and looks at them hopefully. Toru overtakes the monster and approaches Sisson, touches him and brings him back to life. Sisson recognizes him. Toru moves quickly and is already attacking the armored boar with his sword. 
However, it slipped and did not damage the monster. Toru thinks that if it goes on like this, then the lightning needle will subside. He thinks hard about what he should do. He looks around and sees a tree. He quickly runs to him, climbs the trunk of the tree, but then he weakens and realizes that the effect of the lightning needle has subsided. He falls down from the hollow and runs away with all his might. He touches the tree, suddenly the boar is being pressed by the trees. No one understood what it was. Elysia asks what just happened, what this old tree just did. Mu shouts to Thor that he is incredible, and that he was faster than under the influence of a thunderstorm. Toru himself is surprised at his strength and looks at his trembling palm. Rikaru asks Alicia what just happened. She falls down without strength and begins to sob, saying that she has no idea. Rikaru doesn't know what to do, and at this time Mu calms her down and pats her on the head. Toru sticks a knife into the armored boar, which groans in pain. Toru reflects that it is undoubtedly an armored boar, but it is so huge, and even these legs. Then Sisson comes up to him, asks for forgiveness and thanks him for saving them. Toru tells him not to worry because he was just hunting him himself. Sisson starts awkwardly asking why he saved them. Toru only brings his index finger to his lips, hinting not to ask about it and keep silent. Sisson asks for forgiveness again. Toru says that, no matter how you look at it, he has too many legs. Sisson agrees and says that this is not an ordinary armored boar, such as him are called special species. He has already met with such. If monsters are not hunted, their number increases, and due to the reduction of the habitat area, mutations begin to occur. Modified, battle-hardened individuals are called special species. Toru informs Sisson that they had found a goblin cave before, and that they had suddenly started climbing out. He is surprised by this news. Toru asks him if he could help him. At this time, Rikaru asks if it doesn't look like a big problem. Hisoku agrees with him and says that it is. Elysia asks Sisson what he thinks, he confidently replies that he will go with the Torah. They silently nod to him in agreement. Toru says that it would be better for them to get out of here first. After all, this is the territory of the armored boar. Sarah asks if they will leave their prey here. Mu asks if Toru doesn't want to eat meat. Toru says they will pick him up on the way back, so they should go with him. Mu says he can't wait to get back. Sawmills are located in the northeast and southeast, and another one on the forest trail. They come out to a forest path and Toru says it's great. He tells the others to go to the southern sawmill. The three of them reach the northern sawmill. A man meets them and is happy to see Tora, but as soon as he tells about the circumstances that goblins are climbing out of a cave nearby and that the situation is very dangerous, panic envelops his face. He screams that it can't be. The man gives a signal through the sound and shouts that they are leaving the cave and that they should evacuate. He announces that an invasion is coming soon and that the city needs to know about it, so they are preparing a signal smoke. Toru tells them to run and that they will take care of the rest. The man shouts on the way that they rely on them. They see the second signal from afar, and Toru realizes that Sinan's group has also succeeded. The man shouts that he can already see the wall, so they don't have time to rest, they are already close. Toru thinks they have informed them, but there is no blue signal smoke from the watchtower. Half of the guards were also sent to Bosalia, it definitely had an impact. Toru tells the girls that Ural is a hundred times stronger, so he wants them to stay with her. Mu looks at Toru sadly, he says that Toru needs to take care of something, so let her be a good girl and wait for him. Mu asks if she can go with him, Toru tells her that he will come back as soon as everything is over, and until then he leaves Sarah to her. Mu doesn't answer anything and looks sad. Toru gropes her cheeks and calls her a good girl. They say goodbye, Toru runs away. After him, Sarah shouts take care of yourself. Harlos meets them at the gate and asks Sarah where the old man is. She replies that according to Toru, he needs to take care of something. Carlos is outraged why he needs to do this at such a moment. Carlos says that the red smoke means something bad, then Mu drives his cart into his leg. Carlos rides in pain and asks what she is doing. Mu yells at him to get lost, calling him a suspicious type. She tells him to leave sister Sarah alone. Sarah awkwardly tells her that everything is fine. Sarah says that it's still very bad because a lot of goblins appear from the cave. Carlos tells her that this is impossible, because the cave was taken care of 10 days ago. If an invasion was being prepared, it would take another month. Carlos thinks to himself that it is even more difficult to believe that the old man will make a mistake in such a thing. He says out loud that everything is very bad, and the guys from the southern sawmill still haven't returned. Carlos starts to say that blue smoke is visible, so if something happened to him during the return, he abruptly rushes from the place and shouts to Sarah to go, because she needs to hurry up. Sarah asks him to wait and shouts that she will help him. Carlos asks what Sarah is talking about, she can't go there. 
he says that she's a young girl, that she hasn't been an adventurer for 10 days yet, and this may actually be an invasion, so he can't take her. Then he adds that, besides, if he takes her with him, the old man will give him a hard thrashing. Sarah stays in place thinking that she could at least show people the way through the forest. Sarah turns to Mu and says she has things to do, so could she come home alone? Mu shakes her head and says there's no point even discussing this. She doesn't understand what she's talking about. Mu tells her that Toru entrusted sister Sarah to her, so this is Mu's job. As a result, they both go to the forest to help people. Sarah points the way to the outer gate. Other people run in panic, shouting hurry or they will be captured. Sarah asks one of them what happened. The man sees her G-rank badge and tells her to quickly hide inside, too, because there is a huge boar there. He already thought that they were finished. Another adds that it's their fault. They didn't believe the four who came to warn them, so they were too late to escape. Another says that in the end, one of them had a hole in the shield, but when they saw the smoke signal from the second point, they realized that it was true and fled in panic. When they had already seen the outer walls, they were attacked by a huge boar. The four who accompanied them had to attract its attention to themselves, so they barely managed to escape. Sarah anxiously asks what happened next. He replies with disappointment, if only he knew. He's going to tell the gatekeepers, he hopes it will help them somehow. Sarah wanted to say something, but the man interrupts her and says that they can blame them if they want. But that's the job of adventurers. Sarah says how it hurts her when she can't do anything. Mu says she doesn't feel anything like that, that she's just following Toru's instructions. Sarah smiles and says that Mu is a very good girl. She starts stroking her head and notices a tuft in her hair. She touches him. Mu reacts with a scream as much as possible. Sarah asks for forgiveness and asks if it really hurts her. Mu replies that no, everything is fine. It's just a strange feeling for her. She starts scratching this tuft and laughs, asking if it's nice for her, and Mu herself gets pleasure from it. Mu tells her that she can continue to do so. Sarah examines her head and says that there is a second one here. Sarah asks to tell Mu if it's true that they get along very well. Mu replies that it is. Sarah squats down and asks if she can also try the same unity. She asks Mu to look here, because her appeal is undoubtedly becoming more useful. I wish she could find a good way to express her love. Mu asks if Sarah will hate it when they become one. She assures that this will not happen. Mu asks if she won't get angry even if it's unpleasant. Sarah replies that she won't get mad for anything. Suddenly, people run out of the trees in a panic, followed by an armored boar. They are wary. The monster was about to attack one person, but then Sarah uses a conversion, after which the monster hits the barrier, smashing his face. Sarah shouts to the man to run now as soon as possible. He thanks her for saving him. The monster slowly gets up. Sarah grabs the rope of the cart and tells Mu to hold on tight. They run away. Mu shouts to everyone that the boar got up. Magic stones begin to pour out of these sleighs. Sarah thinks to herself that there is no time to worry about a magic stone. They all run away with the last of their strength to the gate. The guards shout at them to run faster and that they are already close. They're panicking because the monster is almost catching up. They cross the threshold. Sarah exhales with relief and tells Mu that they have succeeded. But Mu is not in the sleigh. Shortly before, when Rikaru was distracting the boar so that the others would escape, Hisoku shot arrows directly at the monster from other bushes. Sinan was hiding by another tree and preparing his weapon. He remembers Toru's words that the improved version of the armored boar has more legs, so its speed is also improved. Because of this it does not fit into sharp turns. Sinan throws a stone at the boar with the idea that using this factor as a shield, even they will be able to evade it. Sinan admits that it is still impossible for them to fight face to face with an armored boar. Therefore, all they need is to buy some time to allow the workers of the sawmill to escape, and then survive themselves. Then suddenly Carlos appears in front of him, apologizing for making them wait. He informs me that he will take care of him now. The other three come out of the bushes and rejoice at the arrival of Carlos. The monster is coming at him, but Carlos wounds him in one leg, and then the second. And the last spear digs right into his mouth. Carlos says that now is not the time to open his huge pig snout. He says it's the end and throws a spear at the monster. An electric flash suddenly activates, which surprises Carlos. His spear is electrocuted and hits the entire monster's face, leaving nothing of it. Carlos smiles, other guys approach him. Carlos says that since the invasion turned out to be just a rumor, he tells them to get out of here or they will be late for the festival. At this time, Sarah is frantically looking for Mu. She asks people if they have seen a child here. The man replies that he hasn't seen her since they passed through the outer gate. Sarah hits the gate in a panic. She is stopped by fear and asks what she is doing. Does she really want to kill them all? Sarah says that Mu has disappeared. 
Rickon pushes her and speaks as if he cares. He locks the gate. Sarah asks him to wait. Rickon tells her that she can die if she wants to, but don't let him drag them into it. Sarah says that Moo is still outside. Rickon shouts to her, so she wants to open the gate. Let her not be so reckless. Even a stupid person understands what will happen if she opens the gate. Besides, it's too late, because most likely she died a long time ago. Other people intercede and shout that they remember his name. They warn him that he'd better watch his tongue. Another shouts that he tried to close the gate, even knowing that they were still there. Rickon tries to justify that he was trying to save the city. He is told that his job is to fight monsters. They are outraged and say that this lady, Sarah, has protected them. They shout to Rick that he is being paid very well, so let him do his job properly. And he just lies around all day. The second one shouts that he is a former adventurer, so he should be able to deal with that boar alone. Rika hesitantly says that no, he's just a shield bearer, so he can't do it alone. Rickon suddenly runs away from the gate. The townspeople are chasing them. Sarah suddenly hears that Moo is causing a thunderstorm. She abruptly gets up and knocks on the huge gate, asking Moo if she is there. Sarah only hears her words about protecting her sister. Then Sarah remembers the words that Toru entrusted Sarah to her, and that when the gate was closing, Moo herself jumped off the sled to make it easier, that's why not a sound was heard. Sarah begins to tremble and cry, regretting. She says that it's because she didn't listen to the Torah, all because she didn't go to the city from the very beginning. Sarah starts shouting through the gate of Moo that she has a request. Can she listen to her, just for a little bit? Only this time she wants to become one with her. They hear the sounds of battle. Sarah screams, begging her, because if this continues, she will die. Sarah realizes that Moo is now using her electric spike, and that she still hasn't given up and is trying to survive. Sarah shouts again that there are still a lot of fun things that they haven't done. They still haven't tried all the menus of the food stalls. She wants to go to the bath with her again and stroke her whirlwinds again. Suddenly, Moo asks Sarah if she's really talking about the things she ironed. Sarah says they are the ones and that she will stroke her as much as she wishes. She asks again if she will hate it when they become one. Sarah screams this will never happen, because she has no reason to hate her. Moo asks if Sarah will be sick of her, and if she will be cruel to her, Sarah shouts that this will never happen. Moo says that when her mother was cruel to her, she cried all the time, she remembers her mother. Sarah says she would never say such a thing and would never be cruel to her. She tells her that Toru has always been there, trying to save her, and that now it's her turn. If Moo wants to go somewhere, she will be there and take Toru with her. With tears in her eyes, Sarah tells Moo that she loves her very much. After a while, a small smoke forms under the gate. Sarah thinks and begins to dig the ground too. She scoops up the earth and throws it aside, shouting her name over and over again. Finally, she reaches out and feels Moo's palm. Sarah reaches out, calls Moo, and finally touches her. After touching her, a strange sensation overtakes her. Now Sarah sees what Moo sees. A boar is coming at her with great speed. Sarah immediately uses the appeal. The monster hits the barrier. Blood is coming from his mouth. The monster does not stop and attacks further. Sarah uses the appeal again. Then the boar's fangs are already beginning to crack. The third time she uses the appeal, the monster loses its fangs altogether, and then the boar's muzzle separates from the body and falls lifeless. Mu gulps air greedily and sees the monster die. After a while, she wonders if he is dead. She takes a stick, taps it on the muzzle and smiles. She stands up and shouts that she has won again, and that she is actually incredibly strong. On the other side of the gate, an exhausted Sarah thinks to herself that it was she who defeated him. She falls to the ground unconscious. An hour and a half after the smoke signal was noticed, the garrison flag was hoisted on the clock tower, and the guild members began to gather. Due to the fact that a large number of high-ranking adventurers went to the operation to return Bossalia, a detachment of shooters consisting of ranged fighters and gatekeepers took up defensive positions on the wall. In total, there were about 30 people in the squad. Another four dozen adventurers formed a melee squad. They went out of the gate to conduct a counterattack. Gatekeepers below E rank and a large number of low ranked adventurers took up a position in the city square in case the protection of the gates or walls was broken. One of the commanders announces to everyone that a large number of enemies have been discovered at the northern gate. They look down and see numerous goblins riding armored boars, caterpillars, and other creatures crawling separately from them. Boars are furiously driven into the wall. Slugs and caterpillars stand against the wall so that goblins can get up. Someone bends down and shouts that he will deal with these terrible goblins. The second one shouts to him not to be so reckless and not to stick his head out like that. 
The next second, the goblin throws a stone right at his head, which he dies from the rupture. Slugs grab people by the legs, they panic. They pull people down and finish them off already at the bottom. One shouts that they haven't taken part in a real battle for a long time. He offers to clean up here. He shouts that the enemy outnumbers them, so they shouldn't hold back. They should stop them with everything they have. They obey him. To deal with the overwhelming number of opponents, several magicians combine their spells. Earth mages use the magnetic earth shield to create shields from goblin throne stones. Taking advantage of this, the archers began to shoot. And behind the defenders of the walls, the support squad played a song of valor in order to increase their morale and not let fear bind their hearts. Fire and lightning mages use their spells to thin out the goblin hordes. Suddenly slugs arrive to them, one shouts that they use caustic bullets. Someone groans in pain, he says that it looks like they got tired of waiting and finally decided to show themselves. These are hobgoblin shamans. Archers shoot using a tracking arrow, so they won't be able to hide. Arrows kill goblin mages by hitting them right in the head. The commander shouts that it's great and that he's leaving the melee squad on them. The soldiers are already attacking the goblins themselves from the bottom. People are killing monsters one by one. Dadden in armor comes forward here. People say that you can't tell who the real monster is here, which is to be expected from their boss. He uses a roaring lightning bolt. People start to panic that they might be hurt too. He fires lightning, killing all monsters, including boars, with one blow. A huge pit is formed on the ground. One of the soldiers says that he really overdid it. Another shouts for all people to get back behind the walls before the downpour starts. The rain begins to drip, Dadden puts his hand on the wall. Dadden shouts that by some miracle they were able to contain them all. According to Toru's report, only the northern wall was restored, and it was on it that the monsters decided to attack. They concentrated their attack on a strong fortified part of the wall. He is sure that the hobgoblins are much smarter. Then it comes to the fact that, besides, their leader was nowhere to be seen. Dadden clicks and says that so it was just a distraction. He raises his head up to the sky. Shortly before the battle for the north wall, Toru is diligently heading somewhere with the idea that he needs to rebuild as much of the south wall as he can. On the way, he notices some rustling. He looks out cautiously there and sees hobgoblins walking in groups through the forest. Toru wonders why their tracks are here, why the goblins, who should have immediately headed for the wall, hide in the nearby forests. He understands that the battle at the north wall has already begun. He thinks about what he should do, maybe he should go back and call for help. He departs from this idea because if this is the hobgoblin's real goal, it would be too late to run to the north wall. He recalls the events of ten years ago and says that just not this, that he will not let it happen again. Most of all, he doesn't want to lose that happy dining table. Then he notices that the goblins are starting to break part of the wall. Toru realizes that that attack wasn't really just a distraction. He clenches his fist. He wonders if he can defeat the hobgoblins at the forest without disturbing the workers at the wall. When he tried to immobilize that armored boar, even after the thunderbolt needle effect ended, he could still move at high speed for a while. He still remembers the feeling when every cell of his body gives its best, but will he be able to repeat it? He pulls out his sword and decides he has to try. He comes screaming out of the bushes with his sword, catching the goblins by surprise. Toru makes several swings with his sword, depriving several goblins of their heads. He immediately hides behind a tree, as there are many of them. His hand is shaking from the strain, but after recovering, he comes to his senses and thinks that at this rate he will be able to deal with them. Suddenly, he begins to feel a terrible dark aura. He thinks, is it really the one who ordered his troops to attack the north wall as a distraction, leading a surprise attack on the north wall? Is this the hobgoblin leader? Toru realizes that their strongest warrior has entered the scene. At this time, the wall is falling, the goblins have broken through. Toru understands that at this rate the city will not be able to contain the attack from both sides. He goes to them. The goblins notice him and turn to him. First he robs one of the heads. Toru touches the wall and restores it again, surprising the goblins and infuriating them. Toru is surrounded by numerous goblins. He realizes that about a dozen of them have broken into the city. Goblins attack him. He makes swings with swords, depriving alternately of the head and limbs. One of the goblins will still hurt him. With a trembling hand, he tries to restore his body, but one of the goblins quickly runs towards him. The goblin deprives Toru of his sword and stabs two swords into his stomach at the same time. Thor's mouth is bleeding. He raises his hand and plunges his knife into the eye of one of the goblins. While the second is shocked by the actions, Toru pushes him, kicking his chest. The goblin falls backwards. Toru takes the knife pierced in his stomach and removes it with a cry, coughing up blood. 
Goblins look at him attentively and are horrified when they see that the wounds have healed and there is no blood now. He's still fighting and taking the goblins' heads off. Here a speech is made asking the god of ice to grant eternal rest to those who have sinned by going against his will. Someone called for an ice dream, which is used by members of the Ashen clan. The spell distracts the attention of its targets and puts them to sleep for a while. Goblins fall asleep. Toru realizes that only one person in the city is capable of using such ice magic. Eril approaches him. While all the goblins are sleeping in an upright position, the hostess congratulates Thor with a smile on his return. Toru asks the hostess what she is doing here. She sighs and replies that such places are being attacked in these times, and that's why there is such cheap housing here. Goblins suddenly wake up, but they did not have time to react in any way, because Toru deprived them of their heads. He still hadn't heard the bugle signaling their victory from the north. He thinks he has to do something before the head of the hobgoblins and his troops get a chance to go somewhere else. He turns to the hostess, who nods her head and says that she may not be able to fight for a long time, but she asks to let her help him. Toru smiles and nods too. He approaches the wall, places his palm and restores it with the thought that after that he will have only three uses left. The goblins break down the wall again and crowd into it. They turn around and see Ural conjuring again telling them to find peace. While they all hibernate, Toru immediately kills them on the spot. The second goblin clan also bursts in, behind which their leader stands and lets the fog in there. Ural conjures ice crystals, goblins freeze in fear again, Toru swings his swords, they bleed and tremble, but they can't do anything about it. Toru thinks it's incredible. Just by inhaling these tiny crystals, the regenerative abilities of the hobgoblins were completely suppressed. He realizes that all he has to do is chop them up, which he does. He turns to the hostess and sees that she is ill. He manages to catch her before she loses consciousness. Even though she used low-level skills, using them many times against several opponents, while interrupting their movements, probably caused this exhaustion. She must have used an incredible amount of magical energy. The hostess leans on his back. A new crowd of goblins burst in. Toru picks up a moment in time in which the hostess had her maximum supply of magical energy. Then he will completely restore it. Goblins come in, see the corpses of their comrades and want to run back, but immediately die because their leader is already coming in. Toru realizes that this is the head of the hobgoblins. He asks Ural if she can go. She asks if it's really thanks to Thor. Even the pain in her thighs has completely disappeared. Toru says he'll figure it out somehow, so he asks her not to overdo it too much and to rest. Ural says that to defeat the head of hobgoblins, you usually need five heroes of F rank. Isn't it like a test that you need to pass to become an E rank hero? Toru tells her not to worry. He'll be fine, he asks her to just watch from a safe distance. Ural says she understood him, so she will leave him to the Torah. Ural leaves, the head of the hobgoblins begins to growl. Toru is trembling all over with excitement. He looks at his body and thinks that this skin is like armor, and besides, it looks like he's wearing bare fur. He wonders if this steel blade will be able to cut her. The monster attacks him. Toru comes to the conclusion that he will just have to aim at his head or the edges of his limbs. The monster swings his weapon. Toru manages to dodge and attacks him in response, hitting his face with his sword. The monster gets even angrier and attacks him again with his huge bone. Toru dodges again, going to the side. The goblin's face begins to emit smoke. His wound heals completely, and he licks the rest of the blood from his own face. Toru realizes that it is useless, even if he attacks body parts that are not protected by the mech. He will still regenerate all the damage done by it. He stands, his hands trembling, and with him his sword. He comes to the conclusion that there is still one place where his blade can do damage. Toru abruptly moves from his place and attacks the monster with his sword, aiming at the eyes but he abruptly raises his arms, protecting himself with his forearms. The monster lets smoke out of his mouth. Toru barely holds on from the tension. However, the goblin's hand slips and Toru hits him right in the eyes. The monster screams loudly in pain, covering his eyes with his palm. He stumbles and loses his balance, at which point Toru attacks again, wanting to overwhelm him with a barrage of attacks. Then the monster reaches out his hand and grabs Toru by the collar. Toru realizes that he is caught. He reaches out and touches the wall, then uses recovery. The wall begins to grow. Toru falls on his back. The wall is clutching a goblin, who can't see anything right now. Numerous stones fall on him. Toru is breathing heavily and thinks that he was able to return this wall to the moment before the hobgoblins made a hole in it. Ural comes up to him and says it was a good job and he must be tired. 
he turns his head and thanks the hostess. In a moment he falls silent, because the young Ural, Toru opens his mouth in shock, his cheeks begin to blush at the sight of her. Ural asks if something is wrong and that his face is so red. He awkwardly mumbles that this is not so. Toru stands up and stabs the goblin leader in the head. He asks if those two have returned to the house, she replies that they have not returned. Toru thinks to himself that for some reason the hostess has not noticed the change yet. Toru can't even use recovery in secret, because he has no more uses left. Ural says she will look after everything here, and she asks him to hurry up and return to the gate. Toru thanks her and says he will leave it to her. He leaves her in a hurry, and Ural is thinking about what to cook for her today. The rain is ending, the drops are flowing down the plants. Carlos tells Thor that he is late because the party is already over. Next to Carlos is that group with Sisson. Toru is surprised and says that he thought the gathering point was somewhere else, and that it looks like the four of them were able to figure it out. Sisson says that right after the horses finished with everything, they ran into another armored boar. But Carlos saved them, then they met Sarah and Mu at the gate, so they stayed and protected the area. Carlos says that right before the gate guards appeared, they united after that and staged a massacre, tracking down the remnants of the troops in the forests. Toru tells him that he owes him. Carlos blushes and awkwardly says that this is not the case, and that it's better for him to just find his way along which he can move on and not worry about such little things, like some kind of debt to him. Suddenly, someone calls to Thor, he turns around and sees Mu and Sarah running towards him. They both hug him tightly. Carlos and the others look at them with warm looks. Toru immediately realizes that Sarah seems to have used the conversion until she completely used up all her magic. Sarah begins to say that, in her opinion, after all this, she finally realized that in order to risk her life for someone else, it takes a lot of willpower. She says that she is very sorry that she did not realize this sooner, and that she is sorry that she did not return to the city immediately. Toru says that it is clear to him, and that the fact that she realized it is more important than anything. Mu asks if he wants to hear how she defeated the boar, Sarah says that it was she who defeated him. Toru stares at them intently, and then suddenly starts hugging them very tightly, the girls blush and rejoice. Toru says that they have given their all, haven't they? He can't describe in words how glad he is that they are safe. He says it's his fault because he thought to let the adults sort it out. Sarah starts to object and says that it's not his fault but her fault, because she couldn't do something so simple. Mu says she protected Sarah, just like he told her to. Sarah begins to get indignant and pull Mu's cheeks, saying that it's not good to protect her like this. If she does it again, she will get very angry. Mu reminds me that Sarah said she wouldn't be angry. Toru looks at their interaction and smiles. He wonders if they are finally starting to get along with each other. The day after defending Dadan City from the goblin attack from the goblin forest, the troops that were sent by Deputy Chief Sacco returned. The report confirmed the details of the investigation, which had been underway for some time. The area next to Bossalia that was destroyed turned into a huge dungeon. High rank seekers suddenly entered the dungeon and dealt with the threat of any problems. The real problem is the fact that this infiltration happened lazily before the goblin attack on Dadan. At Choi's institution, teacher Dadden tells Sacco, does he really want to tell him that yesterday's goblin attack is somehow connected with the destruction of the dungeon in Bossalia, something like bad consequences from its destruction? Sacco replies to him that this is purely his assumption. Further investigation is needed to determine the cause, in his opinion. Sacco adds that, in addition, after the report of the attack, the measures for confrontation were weak. And besides, everyone was distracted by the sabotage of the goblins which allowed them to enter the city. The last of them was easily defeated by some passing seeker, but this does not negate the fact that the efforts made were a complete failure. Dadden laughs and says that then thank you very much to this passing seeker, if not for him, then the tragedy of Bossalia would have been repeated. Sacco gets angry and says it's not a joke. Dadden answers him that he understands what Sacco is trying to tell him. He wants Dadden to reorganize a number of gate guards, in short, to reduce their number. Dadden is already shouting that he will not just sit idly by. He will redistribute the savings to rebuild the wall. Sacco drinks and says calmly that it's up to him to decide what to do, and what he can say to this committee at the next meeting, and that he also needs to reward those who bravely fought yesterday. Dadden exhales and says that the whole mood has fallen again, although there are fewer of them. There is only more work. If this continues, their morale will fall to the bottom. Sacco tells him that it is inevitable, based on the current circumstances. Since there were no civilian casualties, then this case is far from the worst outcome. But for the gate guards to take all their hands and close the gate in front of people, 
puts them in a bad light. Dadden says they really should thank them for this, that's for sure. Sacco adds that only three gatekeepers died this time, compared to the fact that they lost 112 of them nine years ago. Dadden says it's hard to believe, just to think that his stupid student will become so capable. Sacco says that the one in question was with another seeker, but he is interrupted by the waiter of the establishment, talking about nameless heroes who nobly defeated dozens of hobgoblins in their head. The waiter turns around and says that there is even a rumor that one of these heroes is a beauty with a broom. People in the city have made a fuss trying to find these mysterious heroes. Dadden says that he has become a man, speaking about the Torah, which has far exceeded his expectations. Sacco agrees with him, and both of them continue to drink drinks. Dadden remembers and says that Sacco said something about Lady Ural, being a person who sees through any deception. He can say that unmistakably it was her. Sacco says with a smile that he will be very surprised, as always, because her beauty is amazing. Dadden says that since Toru was able to restore her youth to her, maybe he can get rid of this rude look that is on Sacco all the time. Sacco replies that his selfish desires can wait, now they have more important things to do. Dadden asks if he is talking about Bosalia. He asks what happened. Sacco says that they were able to deal with the dungeon itself, but the boss of the maze turned out to be quite problematic, and that it would not be easy to seal it. That's why he wants Toru to try harder and become even stronger. At this time, Toru meets Carlos. He asks him if he is leaving the gate guards and leaving the city. He confirms this and says that he is leaving with Rickon. Having committed a selfish act, escaping after closing the gates in front of innocent people, Rickon was deprived of the status of a seeker and will be expelled from the city. After all, this hopeless guy has been his partner for a bunch of years, he can't just leave him like that. He reflects on his actions, so Carlos believes that they can somehow figure it out together. Carlos asks Tora to tell Sarah that he's sorry he couldn't take her to different restaurants, and then calls Mu a squeaker and asks her to tell her that Carlos is actually a cool guy. Toru tells him that it will be difficult because Carlos knows that he is not going to lie to her. Carlos smiles at his answer. Toru holds out his fist to him. Carlos holds out his hand without a brush. Toru here tells him that this is his parting gift. He remembers all their joint hunts, how he restored knives. Then he said that was all his skill could do. Carlos starts crying and saying that this skill is not useless at all, not a bit. He thinks it's an amazing skill. Carlos's arm is recovering. He sees his hand. Toru turns and walks away from him. Ural roasts meat. Mu and Sarah are thrilled. Mu asks if it's really a meat party today. Sarah tells Thor that it's amazing and that the meat is so thick. Ural says that they have other board dishes, for example, roast ribs with white beans, young round potatoes and onions. In addition, they have minced meat kebabs with a softened filling with a strong smell. Ural says there's still a lot left, so she asks them to eat heartily. Yesterday, Toru accidentally returned the mistress to her youth, but it would be awkward to turn a woman who has regained her beauty and health into an old woman again. Besides, when he inadvertently asked her about it, he came to the conclusion that she really liked it. Mu wishes everyone a pleasant appetite. Everyone is accepted to eat. Sarah and Mu just fly away to enjoy the taste of food. Everyone eats, not only them, but also cats enjoy meat under the table. They finish eating. Sarah says that she has overeated, and that she can't even take a step. Toru tells her that everything is because she got carried away, and ate as many as five plates of food. She ignores his words. Ural says she hopes they liked her work. Toru thanks her for an incredibly delicious dinner. She replies that it was a joy to her. It was her gift to him in honor of the victory over two armored boars, and that their blue adventurer tokens are proof of that. Mu says it's not fair because she's the only one who doesn't have a blue badge. Toru tells her not to worry about it, because she will be able to get an F rank very quickly. After all, she is the strongest of them. Mu smiles and says it's true. Ural says it's a pity that his promotion to E rank was postponed, because he defeated the head of the Hobgoblins, even if the dungeon itself was not conquered. Toru says it's unfortunate that he missed the chance to get a skill for conquering a dungeon, but he's happy that he didn't end up standing out too much. He adds that, in addition, he did not allow monsters to invade the city and got two gold coins for it. Besides, new equipment can be made from the leather obtained from armored boars. He believes that he is gradually moving forward. Ural smiles. Toru tells her that he would like to ask her something. She asks about what. Toru says if she doesn't mind, would she like to join their squad? Sarah and Mu are immediately happy. Ural looks around and says that she is very grateful to him for the invitation. But an old woman like her will only delay them. Toru then asks, so she then has some other problem. She immediately twitches. He takes her hand and says that maybe he can help her, so he asks to let him take a look. 
he sees all her memories and thinks that even looking at her complete personal history, he does not see any special problems. Then he looks down and sees a kind of black hole at the roots of her tree. He wonders what it is. It is an obstacle to growth that prevents the wearer from gaining skill points and suppresses the growth of magic. Yurul says that it turns out Toru has the ability to see skills without using a measuring device. Then her face changes to a sad one. She says that it was because of this cursed fruit that she had to leave the profession of an adventurer. She tells a story from the past, when the head of the temple came to their village. Residents did not understand what the head of the temple could need in such a god-forsaken village. Someone says she said she wanted to meet Yuriluriel. The others are surprised and call the girl a cursed witch. Someone shuts her up, saying that it's not worth saying something like that so casually. At Ural's house, she asks again if the head of the temple really wants her to become a teacher. She confirms it. Ural thanks her for coming such a long way to get here. However, she refuses her offer. The head of the temple tells her that the reason why someone like her, who is considered a candidate for heroes, left the adventurers. She asks if it's really because of the killer of magicians. She is silent. The head of the temple says that usually a new fruit appears on the trunk of the skill tree for defeating the dungeon lord and sealing the black hole, but in one maze there is a skill that curses those who possess magic. Then she adds that it's just a rumor, as if it's because she was kicked out of the squad, or she's just tired of being an adventurer. The reason she stopped being an adventurer doesn't matter. She asks Yurul to share her great knowledge with him, calling her White Ice. Yurul says that at the discretion of the head of the temple, she became a teacher. She has become a person who places her dreams on the younger generation, helping them grow. Toru says he understands now. Toru says that he checked the effect of the curse. The description says that it reduces the number of skill points obtained after defeating monsters by 10 times and gradually reduces the stock of magic, which should increase over the years. At that time, he was in a panic looking for time with her maximum supply of magic and brought her back with the help of recovery at that very moment. Sarah asks if he can't use his skill to get rid of him. Toru says that, in the case of a branch of the skill tree, he can use recovery as many times as he wants. But with the help of the recovery time reversal effect, the skill fruit cannot be removed from the trunk. Sarah asks if she can take a look, Yurul tells her to try. Sarah asks Mu to help her, she replies that she is so full that she can't move. Sarah tells her if she falls apart after eating, she will turn into a fat cat. They sit down next to Yurul. Mu takes her hands and says that they are starting. At the moment, all four of them find themselves in front of the Yurul tree. Yurul says it's so strange to see the tree so clearly. Sarah asks her if it's not amazing. Mu brags, saying that it's all thanks to her. Sarah says they're busy right now, so they'll put it off for later. She strokes her head where the hair is distributed in a whirlwind. Sarah approaches the fetus, closes her eyes. The others start to panic and ask what he is going to do. Suddenly, after Sarah's actions, the fetus becomes light. Growth acceleration is a skill that accelerates the user's acquisition of skill points and the growth of magic. Toru begins to realize that Sarah just turned the curse with her skill. Sarah says she just thought it might work out. She asks her how she feels. Yurul does not answer her. The next second the hostess rushes into her arms with tears in her eyes. Sarah smiles and hugs her back. Toru takes Yurul's hand and pulls. Suddenly, someone between them screams that she can't breathe. It was Mu who was sitting on Sarah's lap, and Yurul crushed her with her arms. They continue to hug, and Toru sits next to them with a smile. The four of them come to the Adventurer's Guild. Sarah says it's incredibly empty here today. Toru says that's it, because the plan for the return of Bossalia is over for now, and the high-ranking adventurers have returned to their hunting grounds. Sarah says she and Mu will go get ready. Mu says they will be back soon. Toru says not to overdo it there. Toru tells Yurul that everything is fine and that it's time for them to go too. Yurul tells him that she relies on him, let him show her everything here. Even though it's pretty empty here, someone very loud is still present. Toru tells Yurul to go to another counter. Toru asks a worker with two ponytails on her head if they can register a new adventurer. She answers abstractly that it is possible. As soon as she sees Yurul, she immediately begins to blush and stutter in words. She hesitantly greets and says that they accept applications for registration, and that her name is Marika. She asks if she can find out her name. Yurul introduces himself and tells her it's nice to meet her. Marika hands her a paper and asks Mrs. Yurul to fill out the registration form. She laughs and says how nice it is for her to see the letters clearly. Toru asks the employee, because to register a new adventurer, a token of the one who represents him is needed. He shows his badge, the employee sees it. 
Marika looks at the paper and voices the information that she is 22 years old and she is from the tables. She smiles and says that she now understands where these ears come from, and that she doesn't see any problems. Eurl's real name is Eurl Earl, but they forced her to register as their granddaughter, shortening the name to Eurl. Marika puts the ball down and says, could she touch this ball now? Eurl stretches out his hand and puts it to the ball. Toru is hit again by Eurl's skill tree. Even the three lower branches of the skills ice dream, ice crystals and snow cover have fully grown, and the fruits of the skills hang on all the tops. In addition, the branch of the mid-level skill ice flower camp has already fully grown, and there is very little left for freezing fog. All branches of skills have a maximum ninth level, and even if it's not a fact that they will all grow, she already has four of them. Marika says she's just incredible. She begins to think hard about what rank to assign to her. After thinking about it, she happily announces that she will be given the rank of B. Toru is outraged and asks if all newcomers should not start with the rank of G. Marika begins to get angry and ask what he wants at all, keeps climbing and climbing into their conversation. He could not stop doing it. Toru awkwardly replies that this is not the case and that he is just trying to figure out if the system has changed. He thinks it will be problematic if she gets such a high rank. If adventurers are separated by more than two ranks, they cannot form a squad and the hunting grounds they can go to will be limited. Toru looks around and sees another worker who has always served them. Toru asks Marika to wait and suspend the procedure because he wants to make sure of something. She gets angry and asks why to do this because she also works here. Ural begins to calm her down and very politely asks for forgiveness and asks if she could wait a little. Marika immediately changes and answers her with a smile that she will wait as long as she needs. Then he adds a condition, asking if Ural could let her touch her hair. She blushes, looking at Ural. There is a quarrel behind another counter. The visitor demands from the employee to give him the name of this humble gentleman hero. She replies that, as she said, she cannot disclose it at their personal request. The visitor does not let up and asks, then what about initials, because she can do that. She replies that even initials alone may be enough to identify him, so she can't do that. The visitor turns out to be a woman and says that they will not achieve anything like that. After thinking about it, she starts asking again. She asks the employee what about the age, because they will be able to do it, because she has already conceded a lot. She begins to say that this is also a little. A visitor interrupts her and asks with an evil expression on her face if they can't even tell her age. Toru approaches them and answers that he is now 39 years old. Then he asks if their conversation is over now. He turns to Anna and asks if she has a minute. Anna asks if something really happened. Toru says that he has come to register a friend, but it looks like she will get a higher rank. Anna asks if they have already been evaluated using a soul measurement device. Toru replies that they have already passed. Anna says that if so, then she is terribly sorry, but it will not work to change her rank because the registration system has changed. They have made it more efficient, depending on the development of the skill tree. You can get a higher rank. Toru thinks to himself how careless it is, after using a measuring device. He can't even restore the hostess's skill tree. Then another man in a work uniform intervenes in the conversation and asks for forgiveness for this. He says he believes Toru wants to form a squad with the lady he brought. This is the head of the support department, whose name is Shika. Toru says that's about what he wants. He adds that it would be great if they could lower her rank a little. Shika says that they cannot reconsider their decision too much, and the maximum they are capable of is giving her a C rank. Toru reflects that if this happens, they will need at least E rank to form a squad. Shika says with a smile that if his squad gets promoted, there will be no problems. He says that the Goblin Cave, which is a test for promotion to E rank, is currently not conquered by any of the squads. If they want, they can give them priority as the squad that discovered it. He asks what Toru thinks about it. The Goblin Cave that caused the Goblin Invasion. Even though the monsters were defeated, no one has conquered the cave itself yet. Because several days have passed since the victory over the Lord of the Labyrinth, the Hobgoblin leader, he should have already been reborn. Toru answers him that he understands, and that they will do so. The girl who demanded information about the Torah from Anna says, is he really the mysterious hero? She adds that he is older than she thought and asks if he is trying to prove himself before retiring. Toru apologizes to her and says that he lied. The girl is surprised and asks if it really happened that way. The guy behind her tells her that it's probably a lie too. The girl, confused and angry, asks if this is a lie or not. She says that whatever it was, she was just wondering what the person who turned down the chance to become famous looked like. Toru tells her that then their business is over. The girl catches up with him and tells him to wait, 
because she hasn't finished with him yet. Toru turns around and asks if she really wants to say something else. She shouts that, as far as she has heard, he is going to try to conquer the dungeon. She suggests that he arrange a competition to see who will defeat the dungeon lord first. The guy behind her informs her that it looks like this dungeon is quite small, so you can only enter it one at a time. She thinks an embarrassment. Then she tells Thor that she will let him go there first. Thor leaves with a smile and says that then he owes her. The guy behind her says that if she does this, then there is a chance that a third party will win. They have no right to challenge the dungeon at all, since they still haven't finished registering. The girl does not let up and goes after Toru, shouting after him and pointing at him with her index finger that he had better be on his guard. Mu approaches Thor and asks if he wants to take a bath. The girl is surprised and blushes when she sees the child. She wonders if he is married. Sarah comes out in front of her, bows her head and confirms her guesses, saying that she is his beloved wife. The girl is confused and says that they are lying because she has not heard anything about the fact that he has a wife and child. The guy asks her to calm down, because, in his opinion, this is one of Mr. Toru's acquaintances. Sarah greets and calls her name, saying that she and Toru are in the same squad, then she introduces Mu. Mu asks her if she wants to join them in the bath, if she wants Mu to wash her back. The girl introduces herself, her name is Bidiana, and behind him stands her butler, whose name is Godin. Godin says he is pleased to meet them. Toru is disappointed to say that, although he did not want to get acquainted with them. Mu says that if Godin wants to, then she wouldn't mind getting along. Godin sits down, thanks her and asks her to accept it as a sign of their meeting, holding out a candy. She immediately puts a candy in her mouth and says that it is honey, and that it is also delicious. Sarah and Thor are also offered candy. Lydiana laughs and tells her to keep sucking her until their next meeting. She asks for forgiveness, but she has to take her leave. She calls Godin to follow her. They run away, and Toru thinks to herself what came over her so suddenly. Meanwhile, Marika is combing Ural's hair. She says that this boxwood comb is simply excellent, and that Ural's hair is incredibly silky. Ural tells her that even though he is a little expensive, she recommends him for incredible softness. Shika approaches them and apologizes to Ural for waiting, carrying a tray in her hands. He hands it to her, and there lies an adventurer's token. Ural thanks them. Sarah says that the black frame looks so beautiful and mature. Mu says that Grandma has become an adventurer just like Mu. Toru apologizes to her for having to wait, because he invited her. Ural tells him not to worry, because it's not Thor's fault at all. Marika shouts that she can't believe that Mrs. Ural didn't get into the rank. Shika tells her that she should get back to work right away. Toru says that they will quickly conquer the goblin cave and catch up with her, so he asks her to wait a little. She nods and informs him that she is much more patient than he thinks, so she will wait. Sarah tells her with a smile that most likely everything will be ready in the blink of an eye. Mu adds that if she really gets down to business, then everything will go so smoothly. The day after registering with the guild, Toru and his squad headed to the Goblin Cave. In order to reach Ranki, they need to defeat the Hobgoblin leader living in the depths of the cave and conquer it within 15 days. However, there is a reason why it will not be so easy. One of the features of the dungeon is that some types of minerals can be extracted from its wall. For this reason, when someone explores the Goblin Cave, they are accompanied by miners, and detachments are required to ensure their safety. Although the Goblin Cave has only about three underground levels, due to the constant flow of miasma, even if you defeat a hobgoblin, it will revive within a couple of hours. Thus, miners can only work during safe hours. They come to the Goblin Cave. Sarah asks Toru if it wouldn't be faster to explore the cave while they dig. He replies that battles during the extraction of crystals are prohibited, since miners may be involved in it. They have no choice but to advance, alternating battles with monsters and mining minerals. Toru tells the miners that they are going to explore the first level, so they should get ready. One of the miners wonders if they will be safe together with the detachment in which the child is. The other one answers him. Who knows, since the Adventurer's Guild has given them permission, they can only wait. They pass through a dark, narrow cave. Sarah tells Thor that it's so dark here that she can't see anything. She wants to light a lantern. Toru tells her not to turn it on, or else she will become a target of hobgoblins. Sarah says she can't even see where she's going at this rate. She touches something and makes a sound. Toru remembers something and says that he uses Mu's eyes, which see perfectly in the dark. Mu confidently tells them to leave it on her. She's using her ability. The view opens. Sarah is surprised and says that they can see even in complete darkness. She thinks that Mu is incredible. Suddenly, a stone is flying towards them. Toru defends himself against him by putting his sword to him. He says they showed up quickly. 
He looks more closely and hears sounds, then tells the girls to follow him, keeping their distance. He steps forward, reflecting the stones again and again. He sees two monsters jumping at him with an attack. He takes both their heads with one swing of the sword. Another goblin throws a stone. Toru defends himself by exposing the dead body of another goblin to the blow. He, along with the body, goes straight at the goblin, piercing him with his sword. At this time, the miners are enjoying drinks, one says that they will not be for a long time. He offers the others a snack, the second supports and laughs. Suddenly, Toru and the girls come out of the cave. The miner asks them if they have already given up and returned. Toru replies that they are finished, which surprises the others. Toru tells the miners that they can go, since they have cleared the first level. They don't believe it and ask if it's true, because less than an hour has passed. Toru shows them a handful of severed goblin ears. The miners freeze in shock with their mouths open. The miner clarifies whether it is so safe now. Toru says that it is, and that there shouldn't have been any left. Sarah says with a smile that they cleaned up everything perfectly. Mu says that she worked hard, so now it's safe there. The main miner tells the others to get up, stop being lazy, because it's time to work. Another is outraged that this is despite the fact that he himself was talking about a snack a second ago. They all go into the cave together. Sarah notices something about Toru's sword and asks if his sword belt is not sagging. Toru says that he is quite old after all. She asks if he can't restore it. Toru says that his recovery does not work on items that are not intended for battles. It can only restore weapons and armor that receive direct blows. Sarah says she understands now. Toru says it's great and suggests they clean up the neighborhood from monsters while the miners dig there. He sees Mu doing something with the stones with the miners. Toru asks what she is doing with the resting miners. Sarah replies that Mu said it was fun to stack mountains of stones and that she was completely open to them. Toru calls Mu to the cave and she tells him that she is tired of doing the same thing over and over again. As soon as the miners realized that the Toru detachment, despite its appearance, was quite capable, the number of miners began to increase day by day. A few days later, the number of miners increased to 20, and in case of an attack by monsters, a new detachment joined the camp near the cave as a guard. This is Sisson and his group. He thanks Tora for his hard work. Rikaru says to take care of each other. Hisoku and Alicia say hello, saying that they haven't seen them for a long time. Sarah is happy and also says that they haven't seen each other for a long time. Toru says that, as far as he has heard, they will guard them on the way home. Sisson says it's all thanks to Thor. Rikaru asks if he suddenly found a lot of courage or just stopped being afraid of everything. Hisoku tells Rikar that until recently, he himself could only swing his sword like a madman, and now he has even learned to retreat. Rikaru says that even Hisoku has learned to shoot an arrow without posturing. Alicia says that now she has less stress as a healer and she can relax and watch the fight. Toru just smiles at their statements. Alicia remembers and says that they would like to ask the Torah about something. Toru immediately thinks about mining ore. He replies that he doesn't mind, because this time they gave up the mining rights. Everyone is happy, Mu too. Toru stops her and says that it's not her. Mu says irritably that she wants to dig too. Toru asks her if she has always liked burrows so much. She replies that playing with stones is a lot of fun. If you hit a pile of stones, it will start to fall apart. Toru makes concessions and says that when they finish cleaning up the goblins, Toru will help her too, so let Mu have patience. She replies that she understood him, and that this is a promise. After five days of exploring the cave, they collected enough ore. One of the miners says that they will soon finish mining on the first level, and that it has been a long time since they could not move so fast. To be honest, they initially did not expect anything much. The miner says that Sarah and Mu are so cute that anyone will be deceived. Another agrees with him, saying that he is absolutely right. Sarah blushes, and Mu rejoices. Gather asks Toru if they are really going to try to go to the second level tomorrow. He asks if it's okay that they are in such a hurry. Toru replies that they have more or less cleared the first level, so they will wait and see. The miner says it's good that they do their job quickly, but they don't want them to overwork. The loggers told them how they had saved them. He apologizes that they doubted them. Toru exhales and tells him not to worry about it, because he's already used to it. There are 10 days left before the deadline. There are only 10 days left of the deadline for conquering the Goblin Cave. Toru and the girls went to the gunsmith to buy leather armor in order to prepare for the campaign to the second level. Ramo rejoices at their arrival and says that they returned and coped quickly. Toru immediately apologizes for the rush. The girls also greet Ramo. Ramo asks Toru that he is apparently doing great. 
Then he asks everyone if they want to try on new clothes. They're all changing clothes. Mu is surprised. Ramo asks if she likes it. She replies that she has a slightly strange feeling, but she likes it. Mu immediately runs to show Sarah and Thor. Sarah touches her elbow and says what a strange feeling it is, because they are soft to the touch. But if you grab them, they become hard. Raymo says that they are made from the hump of an armored bear. Such an effect is obtained if you put it in several layers. Ramo looks at them with love and says, if only he had a wife and children. Toru tells him that he is not yet 30, so he still has enough time. Ramo smiles and says that he is right. If even he, who turned 40, was able to get such a lovely wife and daughter, then it's definitely too early for him to give up. They look at the Torah. Sarah says that whatever it was, his robe is very beautiful. Mu says that Toru is all shiny. Ramo says that this mantle is made of a blue striped snake that lives in fetid swamps. Because it lives in miasma-soaked swamps, its skin is particularly durable. Toru says that this also means that it is a high-class material, the cost of which is 20 silver coins. Sarah asks him if it's okay that he took something so expensive. Ramo immediately smiles and winks, saying that he received an order here the other day to repair a snakeskin cloak. Toru says that they use the repair as an excuse and use the restoration to cut off some material for themselves, after which they made this mantle out of it. Ramo asks how they are doing with the cave. He says the fact that they made him hurry up says they're having a hard time. Toru says that nothing can be hidden from him, and that this is a race against time. Ramo tells him that, after all, there is also this tradition of not killing the lord until the necessary amount of ore is extracted. Toru remembers Ural to himself and thinks if only they had a little more help. Ramo says that instead of helping, miners become a burden. Toru abruptly remembers something and tells Ramo to wait, and informs them that they will succeed. Lu holds out the pouch and thanks him. Ramo says it's a pouch he made for her in honor of her rank promotion. Is she really using it? He offers to see what is there. He sees magic stones and asks where she got them from. Mu replies that this is food for Ohanamaru. Ramo openly says that he did not understand anything, so he asks for an explanation. Sarah says that these are Mu's favorite sleigh. It seems that she named them so because of the flower-like pattern and the magic stones allow them to fly. Ramo is surprised and realizes that's what she meant by food. Sarah says that Toru is mad at Mu because she rides them too much. Mu sadly says that Toru was angry. Sarah then tells Ramo with a smile that now, if she tries hard during the adventure, she can get magic stones. Mu adds that this is called salary. Ramo pats Mu on the head. Toru tells him that they are already leaving. He sees them off, waves goodbye. Suddenly Sarah turns around and says that she would like him to do something for her. She comes over and whispers something in his ear. Ramo says it will only take him a couple of days to do this. Sarah really asks him to do it for her. Ramo smiles, Sarah comes back. In the goblin cave on the second underground level, they continue to clean up. Mu uses lightning. Toru reflects the blows with stones again and again. He harshly attacks the goblins and robs them of their heads. He notices a certain blow, it's a bullet of corruption. As he thought, hobgoblin shamans meet from the second level, and their teamwork improves. He easily kills one shaman. Sarah asks what the smell is, Mu joins the question. Toru replies that it's something like a skill used by monsters. If you touch it, the same thing will happen to him. Mu takes Saru's gun and starts touching that smoke, saying it's fun. Her weapons are starting to melt. Sarah takes it and asks Toru if he's okay. Isn't he hurt by this strange thing? Toru tells them to look at his cloak and says that something like that doesn't mean anything to the skin of a snake living in a poisonous swamp. Sarah apologizes and says she should have stopped him. Toru tells her that there is no need to strain so much. It is very difficult to use the appeal on flying objects. Besides, that's why they made the mantle for him. Sarah thinks about it, and then asks Toru if she can try something. Toru is surprised at first, then smiles. She directs her weapon and uses the appeal on his cloak. Toru tries to touch the material with a knife, then says that it has become stronger. He wonders if this means that the skill reversed the effect of the bullet of decay, which reduced her defense. Sarah asks him how it is, now that he can continue to use her. Toru asks which one to continue using. This will be the key to defeating the Lord of the Labyrinth. Sarah rejoices at such words, and Mu asks what other key, what is it, and whether it is delicious at all. They come out of the cave. The miners are worried and ask if they are sure that everything is fine. Of course he trusts them. Toru assures that they won't cause them any problems. They will stop them all, so they don't have to worry. The miner says that he understands, and that then he will use his authority and let them do it. It will also benefit them if they can cope faster. However, he is surprised that they came up with such a plan. Toru replies that the life of an adventurer makes such cunning an honor of a person. 
He asks them to enter in 30 minutes. The miner asks, that is, they only need to reach the end of the first level. Toru replies that this is enough for the Hobgoblin to react. Toru asks Sisson if he can rely on him in case of anything. His group confidently replies that they can rely on them. They go into the cave. Rikaru wonders if everything will be fine with the old man. Isoku asks him if he's really worried. Rikaru asks if it's not nonsense to use the fact that monsters huddle together in the presence of a large number of people to attract the attention of goblins from the second level. He adds that it won't take much time, and it will make life easier for the old miner, but it means that they will have to fight everything at once. Hisoku laughs. Rikaru irritably asks what he's doing. Hisoku says that to think that such an egoist would start worrying about someone else. Half an hour later, Sisson shouts that the time has come and that they are moving out. Rikaru says he is set up and ready for anything. Hisoku tells him that he probably won't have to do anything. Alicia tells them to stop talking because it makes her unable to concentrate. After a while, the miners shout that they are also coming in. Inside the cave, Toru says that the first level has now been cleared. Sarah asks Mu if she can take a look. Mu shows the stones and says to see how high she was able to stack them. Toru says it's great, but he'd like to know where the other monsters are right now. Mu asks if it can't wait because she's so worried about these pebbles right now. Toru sternly says that he would like to find out now. Mu obeys and uses his ability. She sees numerous goblins. She immediately says that there are a lot of them there. Toru says it's great, it looks like it worked. She tells Sarah that they have to stand up. Sarah tells him to leave it to her and that she will have his back. Toru asks Mu where the nearest ones are. Mu points in a certain direction. The goblins are tensing up. Toru easily robs them all of their heads. In the passage between the first and second levels, Toru and Sisson collide. Rikaru says it looks like they took care of everything and left them nothing. Hisoku says he knew he wasn't joking. The miner says that they actually coped with everything only the three of them, and that he has been doing this for a long time. But this is the first time he sees such a thing. This went on for more than a week. By the time the last day came, the head of the miners was speechless. In the goblin cave, on the last day of the conquest, Binietta comes to them with Godin. She says that today is the last day, and that he was able to achieve his goal and conquer this cave, calling him Mr. The Most Ordinary Hero. Toru asks her if they really gave up all their business to see them. Bidiana says that in the end they are rivals. After all, it is logical to observe the movements of the enemy. Godin says that they have not done anything to have the right to call themselves their rivals, but he admires this way of thinking. The girl irritably asks that he is laughing at her. Sarah greets Bidiana, who says that she can be called simply Betty. She notices that her shirt is surprisingly good quality. She asks her to show next time the shop where she bought it. Sarah says she'll show you, and that this shop is just wonderful. Sarah already suggests Betty to go there together. Betty bends over and says that Moo also looks energetic but is as small as ever. Mu punches her with his fist, which makes Betty speechless. She asks why this girl beats her. Mu replies that if they are rivals, then Mu does not want to be friends with her. Godin bends down, pulls a candy and says that for a wonderful temper, so he asks to be allowed to give her a candy as a reward. Mu says that Godin is a good guy, and if he wants, he can become her servant. He says that such an idea is just great. He asks if they can start by discussing salaries. Mu opens his bag of rocks and asks if he means it. Godin says what amazing stones they are. Godin says that, however, no matter how painful it is for him, he is a faithful servant of her Lady Betty, and she wonders why she hired someone like that. Toru says that it's time to end this and that they are going to the last level. They say goodbye and say they're leaving. Betty tells him to try there. Sisson says he believes they will succeed. He asks them not to overwork. Betty says she believes they won't lose, so let them try. Godin tells her what incredibly kind words, but if they conquer the dungeon, it will mean that they have lost. Betty just smiles and tells Godin that it will just mean that they will have to challenge them again. After conquering the first and second levels, to which Toru and the squad were accustomed, after restoring the number of skills used, they went to the third. They come to a strange vast place. Toru says that apparently the third level consists only of this room. Mu notices something and points somewhere, saying that someone is there. This is the leader of the hobgoblins with his huge bone as a weapon. At this time, Ural is preparing dinner, and she puts a plate of meat on the cat's meowing. She says that's all they'll get until Toru and the girls come back to them. Toru tells everyone to get started and separately tells Mu that he relies on her. Mu immediately uses both a thunder needle and an electric spike. He gets that power. It is gratifying to see that she has been able to use both thunder power and an electric spike in the last 15 days without changing the skill tree. 
Toru sees a worried Sarah and tells her that there is no need to strain so much. Sarah says she's just so enthusiastic. Toru prepares to attack and swings his sword. The leader starts growling. Toru immediately runs to him, the monster tries to hit him. Toru dodges the blow in a split second and deprives him of the hand where he kept his weapon. The monster screams in pain. Toru immediately strikes a second blow and only touches the area of his mouth, which then begins to bleed. Toru goes to another place without slowing down and attacks him, grazing his neck. Toru wonders if he's always been this slow. However, after a while, all the wounds of the monster heal, and the blood stops flowing. Against the background, the girls shout at him to try, Toru smiles at them. At this moment, the monster immediately approaches him from behind. Toru notices this and manages to get away from the blow. His weapon grazes his cloak, and Toru sends an electric current into him. Toru thinks to himself that it worked. To apply the effect of the Hobgoblin decomposition bullet by applying Sarah's treatment several times, it was worth it. It only lasts a couple of minutes, but its durability surpasses even that of dragon skin. He raises his sword, which has the same effect on it. The monster roars furiously and starts attacking him again. But Toru first deprives him of his head, then strikes a few more blows, leaving him practically without limbs. The black hole that was in the middle of the cave abruptly changed to an ordinary earth. Toru had heard that when the Lord of the Labyrinth dies, the black hole instantly disappears. But this was the first time he had seen something like this. Girls run to Thor with exclamations that he was so cool, and that it was wonderful, although Mu thought that he would lose. They embrace. Toru says that they are not finished yet, because as a prize for conquering the maze, he should get a skill fruit. He touches the ground. He sees the fruit of accelerated healing. Any damage received or anomalies of the owner's body will heal faster. Toru thinks it's a little strange, because he already has a recovery, but then he thinks it might be useful for healing minor wounds. Toru tells Mu and Sarah that it's great, he tells them to try touching. Mu touches, Toru sees a physical enhancement, which increases the physical strength of the owner. Toru says that Mu's new skill is pretty good, she rejoices and says that she understands. She has become stronger again. The work of an adventurer is not always associated with fighting monsters. Instead, they spend most of their time on transitions, so you can only thank them for strengthening their legs. Sarah also touches, Toru sees pain relief, which dulls the pain felt by the owner if it exceeds his pain threshold. Sarah asks how it works, is it possible that the pain will feel weaker now? Toru replies that, if he remembers correctly, this is the most dropped skill here, and it is very good for the vanguard. It is said that adventurers are able to withstand injuries that should have caused them to pass out, because they usually get this skill when they first conquer a dungeon. However, as far as Toru has heard, it does not work at all on small wounds like scratches. This skill only works when more crosses a certain line. Sarah says that for some reason it seems to her that she got a useless skill for her. Mu brags that here she got the perfect one for herself. Toru only says that everything depends entirely on her luck, as far as he knows. There is only one skill suitable for the vanguard in this place, and unfortunately none of them got it. Sarah notices something is wrong and asks if they are finished now. Toru replies that it would be problematic if the ceiling suddenly collapsed on them. After the black hole disappears, the dungeon disappears after about an hour. Then he remembers and asks Sarah if she could check if her conversion works on the skill. She points her weapon at the fetus and says that, in her opinion, nothing good will happen here. Toru believes that he is not working on what cannot be considered an attack. He suggests that everyone should already return. He steps onto the round earth where the black hole used to be and feels that it is unstable. He thinks it's the same as that time with the stone slab. He says it's probably worth checking out. He asks the girls to move away. Sarah moves away and calls Mu to follow her. He touches the ground and uses it. Everything starts shaking, Sarah screams. The body parts of the leader begin to recover and he comes to life. Sarah immediately pushes Mu away from her. The monster pulls Sarah's hair and pulls her towards him. Toru shouts her name. He immediately remembers and thinks that everything is exactly like nine years ago. Then he says that it's not like that anymore and that he's not alone anymore. He gives the command to Mu, who immediately understands and uses an electric spike. The monster is electrocuted, which frees Sarah. The monster immediately reaches back to Sarah, but she manages to use the appeal, which stops him. The next second, Toru robs him of his head. Toru asks Sarah if she is okay. 
She replies that she is fine, and that everything is thanks to Thor. Mu says he appeared so quickly that he caught her off guard. Sarah apologizes to Mu for pushing her. Suddenly, Sarah says that when he pulled her hair, it didn't hurt that much. She assumes it's because of the skill she's acquired. Toru says that it is most likely so, to which Sarah replies that she was very lucky then. Mu notices that another stone slab has appeared, which she informs Thor about. He gets up, walks over and puts his hand down again. He gets a physical enhancement skill like Mu's. He says that the previously acquired skill has not gone away, and that he has acquired a new one. It looks like using recovery on a stone slab causes the entire maze to return to the pre-conquest state. He tells the girls to try touching too. Sora received accelerated healing as Toru's first skill, and Mu received, in his opinion, a good skill to enhance magical power. Mu believes that she has become even stronger. Sarah is happy for her and says it's wonderful. Toru thinks he has six more uses of recovery left for today. Most likely, it is impossible to return everything to the state immediately before the appearance of the stone slab. If he wants to pull off the thing with the rebirth of the Lord of the Labyrinth, he needs to sharpen the blade as much as possible. If you take into account the danger of bumping into the newly appeared goblins on the way back, then they have two more attempts. Toru offers them a try. Sarah asks if he is going to do something, if he really wants to remove the stone slab. Toru says he wants to do it, so he asks Mu to use an electric spike and a thunder needle, and let Sarah stay close to Mu. For the third time, Toru received anesthesia, Mu, accelerated healing, Sora, physical strengthening. On the fourth time, Toru and Sora got a boost of magical power, and Mu got pain relief. Toru says that this is great, and that now each of them has received four skills. He invites them to return. Sarah asks Toru if they don't need his ear as proof. He replies that no, because the destruction of the dungeon itself is proof. Sarah says that she understands, and that even though he is the lord of the labyrinth, not a single magic stone has fallen from him. Mu tells him that she wants to eat. Toru says it's too early to relax, because the exploration of the dungeon is not finished until they come out of it. They come out of the cave, meet people, and those, in turn, begin to clap them violently, they approach them. As soon as they leave the cave, the cave itself collapses in front of everyone, leaving behind smoke and dust. At the evaluation counter, Inna tells Thor that he has returned unharmed. She asks how it went. Toru replies that they somehow succeeded, and that it was a difficult two weeks with a time limit. Inna says it's a great job. She asks the miner if he has confirmed the conquest of the dungeon. He replies that he confirms that the dungeon has completely disappeared, and that these guys are real adventurers. The miner shakes his hand and tells him that it was fun working with them and that he will look forward to their growth. Inna congratulates them once again, holds out a board with new tokens and asks them to take their tokens. They return home. Sarah sees Oral standing on the porch and shouts that it's their mistress. They are all walking around the city together. Eurol asks if she really can go with them, because she did not participate in the conquest. Toru replies to her, of course you can, and that they called it a promotion celebration, but it's also a welcome party for her. Mu happily asks if there will be a feast. Sarah is also happy. Toru is only mysteriously silent, not answering the question. They approach Choi's establishment. Sarah asks if this is really the place. They come in, they are immediately warmly greeted. Dadden says that they have finally arrived, and they have already started. Sako is sitting next to him and doesn't say anything. Toru thanks them for the invitation. Yurul apologizes for making them wait. Dadden with red cheeks says that everything is fine and asks them to sit here. Dadden points to a chair and says that Sarah can sit here. She says there's only one chair left. Mu says she's too small. Toru pointedly points to his knee Mu. But Sarah happily takes her place, sitting on Thor's knee. Toru tells her that it will be uncomfortable for him to eat. Toru calls Mu. Mu tells Sarah that he didn't tell her. As a result, Mu sits on Thor's knee, and sad Sarah sits on the remaining chair. Dadden says they seem to be doing quite well. Mu asks him directly who he is. Mu doesn't know him. Toru tells her that he has come to them before when he asked him to fix the wall. Sarah says that last time he had shaggy hair. Toru says it's because he used restoration to get his hair back the way it was. Dadden laughs loudly at this. They are served dishes, someone offers to start eating. Dadden says that today is at his expense, so let them take whatever they like. Everyone thanks him. Sako begins to choose something expensive and offers to start with him. And Dadden says that he did not say that he could, so let him not take the most expensive drinks and dishes. Sako tells him not to be so petty, calling him a former adventurer. Sako asks Yuro what about her, she says that only if a little. Sako says that then another portion for her. Yuro asks Dadden if everything is really in order. 
He shouts with emotion to carry the barrel at once, and to grab the beans too. Toru orders round potatoes and sausage. Dadden is outraged that he always orders it. Toru asks if they have regular drinks. The waiter says there is orange juice. Then Toru asks to bring two glasses. Toru tells Sarah that she can order whatever she wants. Sarah says she wants meat then. She points to the dish and asks what it is. The waiter replies that it is the paw of a large caterpillar. Sarah tries it and says it's so soft and delicious. Mu supports and says that these meatballs are very tasty. She asks Sarah if she wants to try. Sarah asks what it is. The waiter says that this is the fat and cartilage of a lizard, skewered, fried, and then stewed. Sarah tries it and says it's delicious. The waiter thanks them. Mu also agrees with Sarah. Sarah wonders how it can be so delicious. The waiter smiles, holds out a plate and asks her to try it. She drinks the broth and is surprised to say that it is delicious. The waiter says if she understands that a little stew is broth. Sarah understands now, that's the secret. She asks how he made this broth. He replies that this is a secret recipe, and that he cannot say, but cooking is at the heart, if she ruins the broth, then she will not succeed. Sarah repeats his words and looks at the hot broth. The waiter tells her that if she really wants to be good at something, she needs to know the basics well. Sarah thinks about it. Potatoes and sausage are placed in front of the Torah. Mu says it looks delicious and reaches for the dish. Toru tells her to slow down. The Torah tells her several times to put it in its place, otherwise it will bake. She doesn't listen and puts a piece in her mouth anyway. After a second, she starts burning all over and tears flow from her eyes. She starts screaming and crying loudly. Toru tells her that he warned her after all. Mu runs away to Ural and buries himself in her legs. She calls Toru stupid and Toru tells her that's why she should listen to him. He puts his hand on her head. Although he can use recovery, he shouldn't indulge her every whim. Ural lifts Mu up to her and says that she hugs her. Baden says that this is straight nostalgia and that his son was once the same. Sako agrees and says that, like his daughter, she is a strong girl who does not listen to anyone. Toru says that Mu has become more selfish lately. Dadden tells him that he must take care of what he has. He doesn't understand him. Dadden asks what he thinks he should do. He should be sure that he gives her enough love. Dadden says that in such times swearing will not bring anything good. Instead, when a child is upset, he should be there. Toru asks what he should do then. Dadden says it's okay, because selfishness is the other side of the motivational coin. So let him let her let it all out. Let him take his time and listen to what she wants to say. Ural says this is really good advice. Dadden blushes as much as possible and says that he feels young again when such a beauty tells him this. Sarah comes up with something and tells her to take a look at something. Mu replies to her that she is not here. Sarah points and asks her to look at Mr.'s chest. Mu opens his eyes and sees the icon. She screams right away, which sounds like Ohanamaru. She asks him if he likes flowers too. Dadden replies that he is not sure about it, but he definitely does not hate them. Toru reflects that this is not an ordinary flower. The master got it by killing the maze boss sleeping on the lowest level. This is the crest that was left after the many-headed snake. Mu says Dadden is Mr. Flower. He replies that he does not quite understand what she is talking about but he is glad that her mood is back as before. Baden strokes her head and says what a cheerful child she is. Sako says that the floral grandfather is just right for her. Baden tells him that he actually has a nickname too. Here Mu shouts that Sako has military eyes. Baden laughs gaily and says that the formidable Sako, known for his seriousness and harsh fighting style, is so spoiled. Sako says that everyone who works hard doesn't have time to sleep. Mu says it's hard and that she works hard too, so she knows. Sako says it's because only the one who can do this job can do it. Mu says she can, and that she works hard and stacks the stones. Everyone laughs. Toru thanks Sarah and says that she distracted her perfectly. Sarah tells him what she's been thinking. Suddenly she tells him that she will make a great broth. He awkwardly says that he is not sure that he understood her correctly, but he wishes her good luck. At the Adventurer's Guild, Dadden says that, as he thought, the number does not match the calculations. Sako adds that this is especially true for Rain Stones. Taro and the girls are coming to them. Mu shouts that they haven't seen him since last night. Dadden asks if they are really going to a new hunting ground. He sees Ural and with a red face says that it suits her very well. Even Sako behind him froze in shock. Ural thanks her. Mu asks Flower Mister to bend over. Dadden bends down, and Mu grabs him by the beard. Dadden does not react and continues to discuss whether Sako knows the location of the magic crystals. Sako says that no evidence was brought to their healing temple. Most likely they were taken to another city and left there. 
Dadden says that this means that the wind user is involved in this. Mu is having fun and hanging on Dadden's beard. The rest of the adventurers are surprised to pass by. Mu suddenly lowers his beard. Sako catches it and says that his hand slipped and that he is holding it. Mu thanks him by calling him Sleepy Mister. The soldiers standing behind freeze in shock, their mouths open. Someone wants to prevent this, but Sako gives the command that it is not necessary to do this. Dadden tells Sako that he is then waiting for his report. Mu tells him that they will see Mr. Flower. Dadden pats her on the head and says that they will definitely see each other. He leaves, slapping Thor on the shoulder on the way. Sako tells Thor that he has finally reached the rank of E. He reminds that the period of non-interference ends in five months. He asks if he has enough time. Toru approaches and takes Mu from his hands. Sako tells Thor to be careful, because the next hunting grounds are not so easy to handle. After a while, all four of them, including Uril, leave in a cart at high speed. The wagon is heading to the north of the border town. They went to the right of the goblin forest and will continue to move north for another four hours. Mu sleeps on Ural's lap. Ural says that Mu was so excited when they first left, and now she sleeps without hind legs. Sarah tells Thor that she is bored. Toru tells her that he will be alert so they can sleep. The seats at the top of the cart are cheaper and with a great view, but you need to be on guard because goblins may appear from the forest. Sarah says she wants to talk to Toru. He replies that as adventurers, they should rest whenever possible. Ural tells Thor that he can sleep too, because her other leg is free. Toru puts his head on her leg first. Then he gets up, thanks and says that maybe next time. Sarah tells him that then he can lie down with her. Toru thanks her, but says that it's better that she lies down with him. Sarah is already surprised by such a proposal. Ural watches them with a smile and calmness. Red Sarah says that she will wait until they are alone so that no one interferes with them. Toru said that if it were not for the annulment, the conquest would be impossible. But Sarah was the only one watching the whole fight, so she's going to raise her cancellation to level 2 during this trip. Sarah repeats again that she will make a wonderful broth. Eril and Toru look at her with love. After a while they arrive at some house. Toru wakes Mu up and tells her to get up. She immediately asks if it's really time for breakfast. They enter a room where people are sitting at tables. Toru walks up to the counter and asks if it's a reception. The employee says that this is so and assumes that Toru is new. The employee greets them and tells them welcome to the Adventurer's Guild River of Blood. The employee introduces himself, his name is Rishi. He is from the Fukasui family, and he is responsible for the instruction here. Toru thanks him. Ural introduces and says that she is glad to meet you. Mu immediately asks her for three bowls of meat dangos. Sarah introduces herself and tells Mu to calm down, because she doesn't have a store here. Rishi says he will first of all tell them how and what works here. The round trip car departs every day at 3 pm, so he asks them to be careful not to miss his, especially crowded on weekends so it's better to pre-book tickets. Toru says that while they were walking here, three cars passed by them. He asks if they can get on this particular train. Rishi replies that these are wagons for transporting construction materials, and there is usually not enough space for passengers. Rishi says that there are hunting grounds further away, and that the Blood River has risen very much, so ten adventurers come here. They usually ask each group to hunt in their respective locations, thereby not creating unnecessary confusion. He hopes that he explained it clearly to them. He further explains that, to be more specific, people of the Red Iron class are operating upstream, which are not at all inferior to the White Iron intended for using. If they cross a large riverbed intended for gathering, then downstream they will see lands belonging to hunters. Toru reflects that in order to cross to the other side, they will have to overcome ten huge behemoths living upstream. He had heard that the hunting grounds were now very crowded with people, so there were some restrictions. But that was a completely different story. Toru asks Rishi how they distribute the work here at all. He says that it usually depends on the hunters themselves and their enthusiasm. If they show themselves during the day, they are among the best according to the results of the hunt. Toru asks if it is true that there are many disagreements between hunters and adventurers. There are a lot of vague hints of hostile relations between hunters and adventurers. Rishi awkwardly replies that this is not quite true. He would like to do something about it, but he does not have enough people. He says that if they need weapons or any other equipment, he will provide them with them. He asks them not to be shy and talk if they suddenly need something. Rishi says that's it, then asks if they have any questions. Toru says that there are no questions and that everything is fine. Rishi holds out the document and asks them to sign. Mu happily asks if she can sign. 
Toru strictly says no, because it is his name that is needed here. Mu immediately begins to feel sad. Toru remembers Dadan's words that he should be sure that he gives her enough love. After that, Toru pretends to ask if anyone knows how to spell his name. He asks if Mu can write it, it seems that she does it much better. Mu happily says to leave it to her. Yurul and Sarah are laughing softly in the background. Mu proudly shows the paper. Toru says that she really wrote it. Rishi takes the document and says that his name is very familiar to him. He asks if they've met him before. Toru says that he has been living in the ogre forest for a long time, so it's unlikely that they could have known each other. Rishi says he understands. Rishi tells Mrs. Yurul that the Blood River will last for two days so she should try not to be late for her carriage. Yurul replies that they understood everything, then thanks him for his help. Rishi awkwardly stays with red cheeks. They get out and go to the river. Mu points somewhere and shouts, are they really lifting something? What is it? A lot of people with bags are collecting something. Toru says it's like looking for precious stones. He says it looks like the sand here contains red iron. Sarah says that this name corresponds to their rank. Toru says that basically, the material that can be mined in this hunting ground seems to have a color indicating rank. Yurul says that nevertheless, the river has a completely strange and frightening color. She hasn't been to the north much, so she's a little surprised by this. According to legend, it is here that there is a crater located deep in the river and the dragon's blood flows out of it, which is called red iron. But this is only legend, the exact reason for this color is unknown. She asks the others, it's a strange story. How can there be dragon's blood here, and from where there is so much of it? Mu asks if she is not beautiful, and that she has such a beautiful color. Sarah says that, in her opinion, it's not worth swimming in this river, otherwise you never know what can happen to the body. Toru says she's right, they don't know what's in it, so tells them not to drink and be careful. In addition, there is a rather increased corrosion resistance. If you soak wood or iron, it will rot or rust in a few days. No ships cross this river, that's why it's very quiet here. They walk along the shore, rolling Mu on a sleigh. She sees the tents and asks Toru what they are. He replies that these are the tents of adventurers, and that you can stay and relax here. Inside the tent, people notice them too. One asks if this is the guy who was in the forest then. The second one says that he is very similar to him. It seems that it was he who won and went Rusal to the temple. Another agrees and says that according to rumors he is very strong and can put down a crowd of warriors, and it would be a shame to be defeated by such an old man. They notice Mu and say that she has red clothes. One wonders if it's not adventurers, they can't believe it. Toru and the girls find an empty seat. Toru asks if they can stop here. Everyone obediently and amicably gathers and prepares. A man approaches them and asks what they are doing here. Toru replies that they are not doing anything, that they just decided to stop here and hunt. The man tells them that the place is already occupied. Toru then apologizes and says that he didn't know what was already occupied here since he didn't see anything. The man tells them to ask if the tents nearby are free, although almost all of them are empty. Toru says he just thought this place was very nice because of the location next to the branch. The man then tells them to follow him. After 10 minutes they all walk along the shore. Toru admits that there are very long distances between the tents. They approach one tent. Toru asks one if they can hunt here. The man does not answer anything and only points to the sign where the cross is placed. Toru asks, it turns out that it is impossible. The man says that if he wants to die, then please. Toru asks what he means. This woman says with a smile that it's dangerous to go there in the rain. Toru says that, perhaps, due to the large amount of precipitation, it really can be dangerous. Toru tells the girls that they should move on. Mu sleeps sweetly on the sleigh. Sarah says they need to find a place to sleep. Tora is suffocating heavily. Toru looks around and sees Yurul not quite cheerful. He asks if she's okay. She hesitantly says that she is fine. Toru suggests taking a break. Yurul is breathing heavily and thinks that she no longer has the physical strength that she had 20 years ago. How she would like to easily overcome difficulties and walk calmly in the thickets. But alas, now it will not work out that way. The plants around absorb energy. It is a plant that has been altered by miasma. He has a habit of absorbing energy from the surrounding body. It is because of him that there is not a single living soul here and simple plants do not grow. Because living beings are afraid to approach him. The man asks them what happened. Toru says they decided to take some time off. He asks why all of a sudden, without waiting for an answer, he starts shouting that he has had enough, so let them get out of here immediately. Mu wakes up and asks what happened. The man repeats that he told him to get out of here. Thor awkwardly tells Yurul that nothing can be done, and hopes that she is against it. Then he picks her up in his arms, and they go on. Yurul blushes and apologizes for causing so much trouble. 
Toru smiles and tells her not to worry about it. Mu asks if he is really going to carry her in his arms. Sarah says that he is, and that she is even a little jealous. Toru reflects on Sako's words that the next hunting spot is quite far away. They pass by the tent. Toru says that they have nothing to do here, so they will go on. They approach the tent and ask, apologizing in advance, if this tent is free. The man looks at Ural's body. He says with a grin that it is absolutely empty. People inside the tent are also smiling suspiciously. Moving a little further away from the tent, Sarah says that it's great that they finally found an empty seat. Thor is invited to stop here and sort things out. He asks them if they can help him. Mu goes somewhere and says that she will come back now. Toru tells her just not to approach the river. Yurul thanks Toru for her help. Toru tells her that they need a good rest first. Toru gives her a folding chair. She sits down and exhales. Yurul says, asking for forgiveness, that she is completely unaccustomed to such trips, and that she is not as hardy as before. Toru tells her that everything is fine, so let her rest. Sarah asks Toru for details, whether it needs to be put here. Toru says he will go help with the tent, so he leaves it for a while. Yurul asks him not to worry about her. Mu collects the stones and is surprised at how big they are. Tora and Sarah hold the edges of the material, drive a nail with a stone. Toru announces that they are done. He slaps Sarah's palm and says they did a great job. Sarah says that she could not find a table, but she found such stands on which food and drinks are instantly heated. Yurul brings cups of hot tea on a tray and says that the tea is ready, so let them drink. Sarah sips hot tea and exhales, saying that she feels so good. Toru turns and calls Mu, asking her to sit down for a while. Mu shouts that she is already on her way and continues to build high-rises out of stones. She takes another stone and hits her tower with it, so that the stones fly away from them far away from her. She gets right out of it. Toru wonders with incomprehension if this is fun. After a while, they get a little closer to the river. Toru tells them to stand, and he himself will go ahead and see what's there. He tells Mu to stand next to Yurul for now so that he can check these stones. They obey him. Sarah tells him to be careful, and Yurul informs him that she understood him. Mu shouts to him that she loves him and passes him her electric spike. They step closer and think he's seen it before, but he can't remember. He's wondering what's on the other side of the river. The stones under his feet begin to move. Black frogs jump out of the water sharply. One jumps out straight to Thor, but he takes a step back. Four frogs are approaching him. Yurul wonders if the spirits of the oxen are angry, so she needs to do something. She uses a sleep spell, after which the animals hibernate. Sarah screams that it's amazing. Mu shouts that they won't lose. Yurul warns them not to make noise, otherwise they will be woken up. Toru smiles and says to himself that this is as expected from Yurul. Usually this spell only works on one. Due to the fact that it dissipates quickly and cannot embrace several enemies, this is compensated by a characteristic magic injection so that the effect does not weaken when the spell is dispersed. Even if a lot of magical energy is consumed, it is not easy to reduce it due to dimensional magical powers. This is a universal spell, so it spreads differently than others and has a more effective effect. Toru kills monsters with his sword. There are poisonous thorns on the frog's skin, so you can't touch them. Because of the mucous membrane and thorns, the sword cannot pierce the skin. Killing them is very problematic. He's going to kill the last one with the thought of how good it is that they can't move. Then an arrow flies to him and hits right on his sword. The arrow is reflected and sticks into the ground. Toru turns around and sees that neighbor of his. Toru pulls out the arrows and asks what he plans to do. He sarcastically asks if he is talking about his arrow. He smiles and says he's sorry he missed. He asks to return it to him, in his opinion, there is not even a scratch left on it. Toru tells him to be careful next time. He rudely replies that he talks a lot and tells him to give it to him faster already. Toru holds out the arrow, he holds it, but at the same time Toru himself does not let it out of his hands. The man's hand already begins to tremble. In a panic, he tells him to let go of the arrow already. His other two comrades say the same thing, that he should let go now, and that they can quickly deal with him as soon as they are given the command. In the background, Sarah shouts at him not to let himself be offended, and Mu asks him to try. Toru just releases the arrow, and they return in anger. Toru comes to the girls and says that it is not safe here, so they should change their place. Those three don't let up. One indicates that they went in that direction. The archer takes out his arrow, inserts it into the bow, and starts aiming. While Toru and the girls are chatting calmly, suddenly the bow rope breaks, hitting this man right in the face. Sarah turns around and sees him groaning in pain, kneeling down. Toru looks at his hand and says that he warned him to be careful next time. If you look, you can see how blood flows along the river. Yurul cast her spell on the frogs again. 
They fell asleep abruptly. Toru approaches them and brings the matter to an end. Sarah and Mu are standing behind them. Toru and his team camped on an empty riverbank, further downstream from the place where they were surrounded by archers. While Toru was waving his sword over the frog, a huge fish suddenly jumped out of the water. She opens her mouth, from which a large stream of liquid with unusual bubbles flies to him. Toru immediately reacts and moves back, but the liquid still flies to her. Toru lifts his cloak to his face and thus protects himself from the poison. At this moment, the fish lets this liquid to the girls, they get scared and panic. But Sarah uses her appeal in time, which redirects this poison back down. The liquid falls on frogs that have not been killed yet. They fall asleep and start croaking in turn. Here Ural enters again and conjures the blocking of the fog, causing frost. There's smoke all around her, then that smoke goes back to the frogs. They freeze abruptly. They are alive and understand what is happening, but they can't do anything. It can be seen by their small trembling. Toru makes a swing with his sword, but at this moment the frogs begin to move. They're heading back towards the river. Toru tries to catch up with them, but you fish comes out of the water again. This fish lets the poison into them again. Toru dodges, falling on his back, hell hits the ground, causing the stones to crumble to the sides. While Toru gets up, the poison flies straight to him, he freezes in shock, not knowing what to do. Here he is saved by Sarah, using her appeal. It prevents the poison from penetrating further and reflects it back back into the river. Frogs at this time hurriedly jump into the river. Sarah screams that they have escaped after all. She sadly shouts to that fish to stop interfering with them. Satisfied, Mu says that they ran away because they were afraid of her. Ural, disappointed, says that they probably should have frozen them better. Here Sarah apologizes to Toru, saying that if she could stop them, they would never come back. Toru smilingly tells her not to worry and that it's not her fault. Sarah is really very sad about this. Thora approaches one of the dead frogs and cuts off her tongue. Mu asks him if he really cut out her tongue. He replies that this is proof of his defeat. He tells Mu to be careful because he is poisonous. From contact with the tongue, his knife begins to melt, but with the help of restoration, he returns it to its original form. Toru turns to the river. He thought that the further downstream they would be, the more room there would be for hunting. Toru says that while they are all resting and drinking hot tea, it seems that there are only fewer monsters. It seems to him that only Mu, who is fond of unfolding, is in a good mood. Toru says that trying to do something with this frog is, of course, troublesome. Ural sips his tea and says that there is such a pleasant atmosphere here. Mu runs to the Tora and hugs her neck. Toru then holds her cup of tea and tells her to be careful. Sarah sees this, gets up from her chair, leaving a cup of tea, and runs to him, too, to hug. Ural says he sees that he is a good person. Sarah tells her that it's enough to hug Tora a little to cheer herself up. It's as if all the problems disappear at once. Sarah asks Ural what about her. Ural thinks a little, because she says that, in her opinion, this is a good way. She pulls a chair closer to Thor and hugs him on the side next to Mu. They catch the calm and close their eyes. Suddenly Mu says that Toru is kind of gloomy. She asks him if something really happened. Toru sips tea and tells her not to worry, because all men have such an expression on their faces. Mu says happily, maybe it's because Mu is too cute. Toru agrees with her with a smile, after which Mu smiles even wider and more joyfully. They're all hugging each other like that. Toru asks them if they think it's worth changing the place of hunting. Ural opens her eyes and says that, in her opinion, everything is wonderful here. Sarah adds that because of these fish, they don't even fit. Toru says that no matter what he can't handle their attacks, he's just afraid that he'll wake them up again. Sarah pulls away and asks if this happens, then why not just put them to sleep again? Ural closes his eyes again and replies that these creatures are quite interesting, snuggling up to Thor. She looks at the river and says that it is a powerful water-based magic, although it also has weaknesses. She says that if you apply several identical attacks to each, the effect of their magic will decrease. Toru thinks and asks Everil if this means that it causes resistance in monsters. Ural smiles and says that's right. Excited, Mu asks Toru if he wants her to go and do it. Toru sets a condition that only if she learns to swim very well. Sarah is worried and tells Mu that she needs to practice it more. She replies that it's good that she will try. Toru brings a cup of hot tea to his mouth and says that they need to sit and wait here. All the girls are still hugging him. Ural says that she is not in the best shape right now, so for her, in her opinion, the best solution would be to rest. Mu asks Toru if dinner isn't ready yet. Toru tilts his head down as if annoyed. Sarah does not understand him and asks what is it. Then Toru turns his head and shouts how long they will sit there and stare at them. It turns out that some strange and unfamiliar men in armor and with axes were sitting from the top. The man in the middle clicks and says he noticed them. 
on the side. The guy is indignant that he said that it was not necessary to stick out ahead of time. That guy replies that he was just wondering when they would start. The third with a smile says that nothing can be done and that he sees such beauty for the first time. The first one again says that he prefers more modest and cute girls. The third one objects, saying that no, because the most important thing is charm and seriousness. The first does not understand and asks if beauty is not in a small and inconspicuous form. The third continues to argue that something else is important. They start fighting already. Fora is seriously annoyed by this. The guy in the middle separates them and apologizes to Toru for bothering them and asks them to continue. Toru shouts at him to shut up with great anger. They begin to introduce themselves. One of the Rorlfs is the eldest son, a responsible and reliable person. The middle son Ninlas, who is two years younger than the eldest, is always responsible for his words. They have two younger ones, and he has a difference of two years with the average. He is very attentive, unlike his brothers. The elders hit him on the head, asking what he said there. They start fighting among themselves again. Ural asks them if they want to have tea. Toru gets angry and asks Ural why she invites them. Those brothers immediately calm down and say that they will happily drink tea, awkwardly scratching their heads. As a result, they all drink tea together in a circle. Toru starts asking something. One of them asks what he will ask. Toru asks with annoyance what they are doing here at all. The average one thinks about it and asks in response why the Torah is asking about it. The elder replies that he personally looked at beautiful girls. The younger one tells him that it's somehow not very good, and shouldn't he have said that he just wanted to check whether he was or not. The elder seems to remember something and starts saying that it seems they haven't been here before, so he thought he could help them. In the background, Mu is sitting on Sarah's lap, unhappy that someone is drinking from her cup. Toru asks how long they have been hunting here. The average one replies that it has been more than two years and that he is already tired of looking at this terrible red water. Toru says they seem to be his neighbors, but he didn't see them on the way here. The middle one answers that it's because they were a little further down the river and that there's a much bigger shore there. Toru asks what about the loot then? He replies that there is none at all and that everything is the same downstream. Toru then asks why not then go the other way. The middle one with a sad face says they can't go there because they don't have money. He says that in order for people like them to get to that place, you have to pay a huge amount. Toru asks them to tell about it in more detail. He agrees and it is proposed to roughly divide the production of this bloody river into three main categories. The most fertile is the upper current, which is full of exuberant hippos, red feathered crabs and other monsters that bring income in the form of materials and points. But, as he said, it's popular so it's not so easy to get there. The next one is the middle current, where they have already been. You can meet red poisonous frogs there, but when it rains, you may be able to see others. Toru asks what is this sign with the black mark of the cross that stands on the way here. He replies that this is what he was talking about. If they were hunting there, they would have problems. He talks about the lower current, where they are now. It's too far away, so of course you can catch fish here, but mostly it just gets in the way, so this is the worst place to hunt. Toru says that's why there are so few people here. He says it's better to wait until the middle current is open than to hunt here. He says that although there is more prey there, it is still not particularly suitable for hunting, because there is a lot of competition here. Toru says that, if you think about it, he was kicked out of there for just standing there when Ural became hard. He suggests that they probably thought they were going to rob them. Toru asks why they would think that. He replies that many pretend to pass by, and then grab the prey and run away. He says that they were almost deceived, so the neighbors will consider them the main threat, and it will be everywhere. But even if they hunt in the middle reaches, they will have to climb to get away from this river. Toru asks again if this is serious. He says that it is, and that there is one faction. These factions take part of the loot, monopolizing profits depending on belonging to a particular race. Toru asks if they are not one of them. He replies that if that were the case, they wouldn't be here anymore. He is supported by his brothers. Toru, after thinking about it, asks how they then get into the upper current. He sips a cup of hot tea and replies that it takes a lot of money. Toru smiles awkwardly and says that this is not the case when you can find out everything through observation. The average one says that they can stand up for themselves, but if someone attacks them, they are unlikely to win. The elder adds with disappointment that they don't even know how to use magic. The younger one sadly says that he doesn't like to fight because too much blood comes out in the end. The situation is relieved by Ural, who asks if they want another cup of tea. The average joyous one thanks her. He says the tea is delicious. The younger one adds that because there are so many beauties around, he is nervous and his throat is dry. 
Iro laughs coquettishly, covering his mouth with a small fist, and thanks him. She brings hot tea. Toru asks them if they know the people who are in charge here. He already sighs, talking about it. The tribes of Red Thunder, Purple Eye and Red Tail have excellent hunting grounds. They contain almost half of all river hippos. In fact, they themselves are one of the Purple Eyes, which is why they were invited here. But the head of the Dedero tribe is a very unpleasant person, in his opinion. Toru is outraged. Does no one say anything about it? He replies that there are rumors that the rioters just ended up drowning in the river. There is silence. Toru remembers the excited face of Rishi when he asked him about conflicts. He continues his story and says that people in black suits are now doing whatever they want. These are the ones from the adventurer's security department. Toru then asks what's next then. The brothers did not even understand him and asked him what he wanted to say. Toru asks, they're not going to continue this now. The average guy with a smile says that Toru is not a miss. He informs them that they have a plan. The older one says he's willing to bet they'd all drown in tears if they brought him to life. The younger one says he's not ready yet. The elder awkwardly asks Toru to forget about it. He just agrees. The middle brother says he can teach them some tricks, but first he asks for a break. He asks them if they have a problem with frogs because the fish are interfering with them. Mu says it is, and Sarah adds that it is difficult to handle. He says that it is very easy to solve. Sarah asks how, is it really necessary to drag the frogs away from the river? He says that the farther they are from the shore, the less likely it is that the fish will notice them. Then the probability of water bombs hitting them decreases. Then Sarah adds that everything is not so simple, because frogs do not leave the river at all. Sarah immediately gives up, and they say that it will be so easy that they will be shocked. With a smile and a thumbs up, they invite them to demonstrate it to them. 